Okay, good morning everyone and uh, welcome back for the second day session. And uh, yesterday's, uh, the lectures were primarily uh, on to see your depth of knowledge. And today, the mostly the lectures are on your skill sets and how you do, whether it's a uh, oximetry interpretation or whether it's a, uh, the echo or and you, of course, the cat lab where everyone would like to have be there. So your cat skills and, and of course, lastly, the quiz where the spotters are there and the next rays are there. So let's start the uh, day today. And uh, our opening batsman is uh, Dr. Sandeep Bansal. And he being the professor and head of the department at uh, Sabdajan, he's, by, he's my classmate right from DM days. So he's a very close dear friend of mine. And uh, followed by uh, Dr. Ramakrishna. Yesterday you heard him in the live cases, though he will be taking the oximetry. And uh, then followed by Professor Hiten Shah, she will be talking on echocardiography and so on. So let's start with Sandeep. Sandeep, over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, is my screen visible now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, I thank you, uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar, so very much for uh, having me on this platform. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, what I have been assigned to do is to speak about uh, distinguishing features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which which to my mind, I mean, I found this a little confusing, but then uh, it came to my mind that this essentially means the differential diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So uh, what I'll do uh, with you guys over the next 20 minutes or so is to sift through the uh, various possible distinguishing features of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, needless to say, I will not go into the management part of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy during this. Now, by definition, uh, this is uh, some of the slides are taken from uh, a presentation and that is available from the Piedmont Institute, which has one of the uh, fine uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers. And uh, so this is uh, left ventricular hypertrophy associated with non-dilated ventricular chambers. And uh, usually, usually not always, the maximum left ventricular wall thickness is more than 15 millimeter. And there are no other conditions which may produce that degree of uh, hypertrophy. That's the basic uh, definition. Uh, as we can see in this uh, uh, slide, uh, we can have patterns like left ventricular hypertrophy that is shown in this particular, uh, uh, as is shown in this particular uh, uh, picture. And we have the septal hypertrophy that we are more aware of you know, as is seen in this picture. Another important, the most is actually what is called a myofibrillar disarray. Uh, that is what we were taught. And normally, uh, the myofibrillar disarray of the myocardial fibers is quite uh, homogeneous. They are parallel to each other. <clears throat> and only 1% or less actually are uh, irregularly arranged. But here, in dilated cardiomyopathy, you find something like this. Okay, so <clears throat> what may be the physical findings? Uh, these are highlighted here and we shall take them uh, one by one as we go on. Oh, I think uh, there's some confusion in this uh, presentation. Just give me one second and I'll share.
Yeah. Okay, am I visible? Sir, slides are not available. It's not seen, sir. Okay, I'll go back again. I'll, I'll unshare this and go back to this again. Is this visible now? Yes, sir. Uh, make it full slide, sir. Yeah, slide I'm doing it. Okay. So, uh, as I said, uh, there is a myofibrillar disarray, and these are the important clinical findings that we find. Uh, uh, see, uh, the clinical findings may include a double or rarely a triple apical impulse. Now, uh, this is something that we hardly find in apex in any other uh, conditions. Uh, sometimes you may have it in um, a, a hypertensive patient who has fourth heart sound, but this typical systolic uh, apical impulse that is double, that is there in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, another important thing is that there is a prominent A wave, which may be sometimes seen in this uh, uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, and that is again an important distinguishing uh, feature. Uh, the typical murmur of uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an ejection systolic crescendo decrescendo murmur. Uh, sometimes when there is associated mitral regurgitation, we may have an apical murmur uh, radiating to the axilla and that is because of the mitral regurgitation which occurs. And uh, this is a, uh, a, a pictorial diagram from a very important article uh, from the heart that is uh, the British uh, Journal on Cardiology. And as you can see, we find seven important clinical findings that are highlighted here. So you have abnormalities in the jug jugular vein in form of an A wave. You find the carotid artery uh, uh, pulse. Uh, we will be discussing this uh, a little later. Sometimes if the obstruction is very severe, uh, you find that the, because of the severe obstruction, the second heart sound, the A2, gets delayed. And uh, when the A2 gets delayed, uh, there is a paradoxical splitting of the second heart sound. And I always tell my residents that there are two murmurs, which are ultra murmurs, in uh, which defy the conventional, uh, uh, you know, uh, maneuvers. Uh, there are two uh, murmurs that are present. One is of mitral valve prolapse and the other one is of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we will be talking about uh, these. And this, the apical impulse being double, I already discussed. Now, when we look at the differential diagnoses, there are, there are two or three sources from where I got these differential diagnoses. So primarily, this is from the uptodate.com. So the primary uh, differential diagnoses are those of left ventricular hypertrophy. And the second category of differential diagnosis are those because of, uh, in those patients who have an obstruction present in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or what we call as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Now, why is it important to be able to diagnose, uh, uh, you know, a left ventricular hypertrophy as being because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or another cause, uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, uh, this is a very important point that in a, among patients, nearly 2,500 patients who actually, uh, uh, you know, underwent septal myectomy. So they've gone so many stages of screening and they underwent septal myectomy. Uh, but when post-operatively, uh, their histological diagnosis was made, uh, approximately 13% had alternative diagnosis. And it was primarily hypertensive heart disease. So it becomes a very important uh, problem to distinguish whether these patients have hypertensive heart disease or not. Another important cause for left ventricular hypertrophy is the athlete's heart, people who are athletes, they have left ventricular hypertrophy and we need to distinguish. 
the third uh, the the second category as i said is because of uh, uh, obstruction to the left ventricular uh, outflow tract at different levels the medscape again describes these as the differential diagnosis and we shall be covering them uh, uh, one by one uh, in very brief manner uh, <clears throat> uh, this is again uh, from a presentation from piedmont institute and these are the differential diagnoses that you encounter as far as the clinical presentation is concerned a lot of patients approximately a third of patients are actually asymptomatic and they present only with some abnormal uh, ecg findings while there will be some people uh, if we look at the bottom there will be some people who will have typical symptoms of dyspnea or chest pain and as far as the signs and symptoms are concerned we need to understand that the commoner symptoms are similar to that which are seen in uh, aortic stenosis valvular aortic stenosis we know this triad very well we are familiar with this of angina syncope and dyspnea the distinguishing feature is the distinguishing feature is that while this is the order dyspnea syncope and then angina this is the usual uh, uh, you know uh, sequence in case of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, um, but the opposite is the direction you have angina followed by episodes of syncope or presyncope and then heart failure sets in in case of aortic stenosis so the sequence in which the symptoms occur uh, help you to distinguish uh, as to what is the cause uh, as i was discussing uh, the pulse is very important and we have typically pulses dysphysiens uh, which occurs either in pure aortic regurgitation or aortic regurgitation with aortic stenosis in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you have an impulse which is called the spike and dome pattern but what really distinguishes what really distinguishes this these two pulses uh, particularly if you have a dominant aortic stenosis which we are more bothered about is the fact that the pulse is parvus et tardis in that case uh, it is a slow rising pulse so you distinguish on the basis of pulse by uh the fact that it is a slow rising pulse in aortic stenosis the fact that it is a bisphyrians pulse if at all uh, in dominant ar which is not really uh, you have other features of ar to distinguish from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and you have this typical spike and dome pattern uh, pulse in case of uh, um, uh, in case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in Uh, in other conditions you may have one a peak in systole and another in diastole or what is called the chronic pulse it is found in different conditions uh, Linson, the voice is breaking. When the <clears throat> next time, um, I don't know if I can do much about it. Uh, um, I have possibly a good interconnet connection. I have. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, Sandeep, now it's better. Now, now it's okay. Yeah. Now it's better, Sandeep. Yes, sir. So, uh, an important thing is that. the flow pattern the doppler flow pattern in case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is this typical dagger like pattern whereas you have a more uniform pattern in aortic stenosis jet so this is another so if you are clinically not able to distinguish this is another feature uh, the third <clears throat> then another these are the important features or dynamic maneuvers which help you to distinguish the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from aortic stenosis and uh, w- w- as i said paradoxical to what uh, actually uh, should be happening to a systolic impulse this the intensity of hocm increases with valve salva and it decreases with squatting that is a very important uh, feature uh, 
this is a more descriptive kind of uh, slide which tells you the various mechanisms also uh, for example what happens in valsalva you have an increase uh, a decrease in both aortic stenosis and mitral regurgitation murmur the as far as the murmur of mitral valve prolapse and uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, it is important to note that the intensity the intensity of mitral valve prolapse murmur does not change much it is actually it is it, it is it is actually the duration of murmur of mitral valve prolapse which gets prolonged the because the gradient between the left ventricle and the left atrium is almost the same all the time whenever the mr starts so the intensity is by and large the same it is the duration which changes and in case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy it is the intensity of murmur which changes and it becomes longer and louder whereas it comes longer uh, uh, with mitral valve collapse and there is a movement of the click towards the first heart sound so so those are important uh, uh, you know um, mechanical maneuvers which we do this is a more uh, uh, diagrammatic representation you find in the american college of cardiology uh, uh, chapters on um, uh, you know pictorial representation of the same now the other feature is ecg uh, how do you distinguish that this left ventricular hypertrophy is because of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy look at the look at the r wave in v2 look at the r wave in v2 v1 and v2 are the septal uh, kind of leads and look at the r wave they are so prominent here this does not happen in the conventional left ventricular hypertrophy due to uh, hypertension or due to athletic hearts another important thing and we are all this is a very important uh, dm question which is often asked these deep uh, t wave Uh, inversions that are seen in uh, uh, you know uh, yamaguchi type or a pikel type of uh, cardiomyopathy these are again very important distinguishing features now we also may have sometimes uh, what are called as dagger like q waves uh, now shifting gears uh, when we talk of athletic heart we need to understand that it is important to distinguish between a pathological athletic heart which has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and so actually it's an entire spectrum you have a pathological heart you have uh, a normal athlete's left ventricular hypertrophy a pathological hypertrophy and you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy nonetheless if we look at the different sources approximately 30 to 40% of the patients actually end up having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as the cause Uh, in young athletes uh, cause of mortality in young athletes and that is important so what the international guidelines say is that routinely you should do an ecg uh, the features of which are able to help in distinguishing whether these patients uh, have uh, left ventricular hypertrophy or not and also whether these patients are more likely to die so on the basis of these normal findings which Uh, which may say that okay no more uh, evaluation is re required there may be features like t wave inversions uh, there may be a prolonged uh, qrs duration for example so there are a lot of features which can say that this patient like requires uh, uh, the thing now these are uh, important distinguishing what one important thing which helps us to distinguish is something that we find on the echo we find that the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not have one uniform pattern so you may have a sigmoid shaped pattern you may have a reversed curve of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy you may have a pikel hypertrophy or you may have a concentric hypertrophy in a small percentage of people whereas uh, in in uh, uh, athletes by and large by and large not you should not always but by and large the most important pattern is actually uh, the most important pattern is actually trick hypertrophy 
And of course, there are points like left ventricular cavity size. If it is enlarged, it is more in favor of athlete's heart. If it is smaller, then it is in favor of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, you can also uh, you know, differentiate on the basis of abnormal filling pattern. Uh, late gadolinium enhancement or uh, MRI scan is a very important help in trying to distinguish whether these are due to um, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or uh, because of athlete's heart. This slide is uh, taken from uh, Brownwald. You guys can go back to this. And this helps you again to distinguish between athlete's heart and uh, the uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are a lot of uh, gray zones or overlap areas. So you really have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy overlapping with athlete's heart. And athlete's heart actually overlaps with a lot of uh, uh, conditions, including left ventricular non-compaction, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, and dilated cardiomyopathy. So this whole gamut uh, uh, in these, one of the important features that uh, stands out is the presence of, uh, uh, you know, the degree of left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, so to distinguish this from, uh, uh, for example, non-compaction, you have to rely on presence of trabeculations. The role of CMR is very important in helping us to distinguish between hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy. Another cause for hypertrophy is old age and uh, the ventricular systolic uh, septal bulge in the very elderly patients is an important feature. And based on the left, in, ventricle, left atrial enlargement, based on the patterns of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the patterns of involvement of left ventricular hypertrophy, based on the mitral inflow pattern, which is a restrictive pattern essentially in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we are able to distinguish between these two features. And uh, when we are not able to distinguish on the basis of echo, we take the help of late gadolinium enhancement. And sometimes we have to take genetic studies to be done uh, when we need to distinguish. Uh, uh, an important fact to remember is that the most sensitive and specific way to look at the pattern of particular hypertrophy, even better is actually MRI. And we should make a, a good use whenever these facilities are available. It is also important to identify the degree of left ventricular obstruction, whether it is uh, present or not, or it is present not at rest, but in provocable state, because each of these conditions determines as to what will be the rate of progression of heart failure in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Another important thing is that nearly two thirds of the patients of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy have genetic conditions or genetic associations. Uh, yet uh, <clears throat> up to, uh, as of 2019, 11 causative genes with over 1500 mutations have been identified. This is the uh, uh, next few slides are from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. These are available. These basically say that you do clinical evaluation and after you've made an overall assessment, uh, you see whether the, there are features suggestive of a specific disease, in which case you try and identify specific disorder. Otherwise, you go for genetic testing. So you need to understand that there is a genotype and there is a phenotype. So there may be patients who have an abnormal genotype but have a normal phenotype and you may have a group of patients who have abnormal uh, uh, genotype but uh, do not have a left, uh, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy like phenotype. Anyway, um, what is important is to remember no one can keep all these in the head but it is important to remember that on the basis of symptoms and signs, one is able to diagnose certain conditions. Uh, again, to continue, uh, if you have, for example, gait disturbance of Friedrich's ataxia, important points to remember are that there are clinical signs and symptoms on the basis of which specific syndromes can be identified. 
there are specific ecg uh, findings such as short pr intervals or presence of av blocks or extreme lvh or low qrs complexes on the basis of which you can identify the various causes or categorizations of left ventricular uh, of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and there are echocardiographic features which tell you that uh, in this particular diagnosis is uh, uh, present so the other thing is mitral regurgitation as i said in case of mitral regurgitation the jet is directed posteriorly because there is the anterior mitral leaflet which is involved and uh, you you sometimes have to put your cursor right here where there is left ventricular hypertrophy uh, outflow and mitral regurgitation to be able to distinguish between the left ventricular outflow and mitral regurgitation an important point to remember is that the 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 doppler velocity of mitral regurgitation jet will be equal to systolic blood pressure minus the left atrial pressure whereas the a uh, whereas the lvot velocity will be variable it will depend on the degree of obstruction so that's my last slide to summarize most hypertrophic cardiomyopathies have genetic basis so we need to distinguish hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, with genetic causes yet the decision to do genetic testing is based on the overall picture in a patient also depending upon the family history it is very very important to screen the family and relatives of these patients it is important to distinguish the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy from causes of left ventricular hypertrophy and also from causes of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction i thank you for your kind attention thank you sandeep uh, it was really an erudite lecture and uh, you really nicely covered in such a short time uh, such an important topic which is often asked in uh, in the exams so now moving on uh, i invite uh, dr ramakrishna good evening uh, good morning sir so dr palajani sir has also been seen now and um, I, i invite dr ramakrishna uh, to talk about the the oximetry uh, i saw the slide of nightmare i think yeah that's a nightmare too rama please dr rama just and uh, yes sir sure is is my size slide visible now yes yes <laughs> so uh, i think the word hemodynamics uh, i think first of all thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, uh, i think uh, the word hemodynamics brings a lot of nightmare to the students and it's a real life nightmare it it happens across all dm dnb exams because this is one area where i think possibly the examiners knows a lot much more than uh, uh, the students when it comes to recent trials and all possibly the students know much more than the uh, uh, examiners so i think uh, when it comes to learning uh, it has to be a long term goal long term learning rather than short term exam oriented learning so most of the lecture here in a 20 minutes i will be covering the core knowledge and there will be some some stimulus for you to go to the advanced learning mode so we start with this is a common simple common garden teaser 18 year old with asymptomatic who is incidentally diagnosed to have murmur uh, with s2 is widely split 3 by 6 esm at base so this is a classical uh, thing uh, to make you understand things uh, it looks like a, a, a phase 98 a asenotic disease uh, svc2 ra there is a big step up there is a 13 percent step up from svc2 ra so is it asd that is the common question that is asked so think over is it asd or not so it is not asd why it is not asd it is because the ra and the uh, the la that the pulmonary wedge pressures are totally different so if it is a large asd producing a 13% step up then both the pressures has to be same so you have to get into the details like right? this kind of a thing is shown that whether you are methodical in your approach you understand the basics or not this is why such a thing is shown so this is actually a partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage so same way another 12 year old with an asd so what is the diagnosis 
FA is 88, and you look at the saturations across the board, they're all same. So the diagnosis is a yes, supracardic TAPVC. So why, why do we struggle? Most of the time in the exams, uh, sometimes in the this kind of a session also somebody answers quickly. But in an exam, invariably we find more than half of the students don't answer it well or answer it with confidence. That is because we are never trained to do this in our lives. Like we always do a cardiac catheterization. So I've seen in our case, a, a lot of people do good cardiac catheterization in congenital heart disease, even complex congenital heart disease. When they are shown these sheets, they struggle. That is because you need some practice for this and there has to be a systematic approach to uh, uh, get through this. So I would suggest a simple systematic approach. So look at, first of all, start with saturation. If it is, first of all, look at FA saturation, whether it is a cyanotic congenital heart disease or you're leading with an yes, cyanotic congenital heart disease. Then if it is a cyanotic congenital heart disease, there are three things that are possible. So immediately identify the two patterns, that is whether it's an admixture lesion like the one showed, whichever chamber the admixture is happening beyond the chamber, all the saturations will be same. That is a classical feature of admixture physiology. Or is it a TGA physiology? What is the hallmark of a TGA physiology? The PA saturation will be more than the aortic saturation. That happens only in TGA physiology. So you identify these physiology or the other third important reason could be there could be a step down happening from either LA to uh, from pulmonary vein to LA or from LA to LV or from LV to IOTA or from IOTA to descending IOTA level. So any of this level there could be step down. So once you identify this pattern, almost all congenital heart disease can be, cyanotic congenital heart disease can be easily dissected out. And identify the where the step down is happening in asynotic congenital heart disease, identify where the step up is happening. That's all you have to look at in uh, the saturation part. So what is the significant step up? This is a this is a very important slide that you all have to remember. So it depends what is the significant step up, depends whether you have taken one sample or more than one sample. So if you've taken one sample, atrial level step up of greater than 11 is considered significant, ventricular 10 is considered significant, and any level 8 is considered significant. So ideally, when you're doing an cardiac catheterization for QPQS assessment, you should take more than one sample. Ideally, you should take SVC, PA, and FA, at least two or three samples. So once you take a mean step up, then the accuracy becomes better. So then you need either five or seven. So this is something that, that all of you should know. Then what is a significant step down? A significant step down is greater than 2% step down with an aortic saturation of 92 or less than 92 is suggestive of a right to left shunt. So what are the common cause of left to right shunt? A step up occurring at a atrial level. So once this question is asked, always immediately, I think your mind will definitely go to ASD. There is no problem in that. The same level, you think of one level above, one level below, and there are, there are multiple causes that can produce to almost all level. So what I mean is like, for example, one level above is like PAPVC, and then uh, you have uh, something coming from the ventricle, which can be LV to RA shunt or a VSD with the TR. RSOV and coronary fistula to RA, RV, everywhere it can happen. So RSOV and coronary fistula will be common to all these things. So same way, applying the same thinking. So VSD will be uh, uh, at the ventricular level, which is very obvious. Or you can have a low ASD. Low ASD, especially uh, whatever you have to understand that the mixing is complete or much better in the chamber that is next to the chamber that is mixing. For example, a low ASD, the blood will be mixing and the adequate mixing will happen in the ventricle rather than the, the atrium. Especially it will also depend on where you take the sample from in the RA. So RSOV into RV and coronary fistula into RV. So causes a step up at the great vessel level. Very simple, PDA, IOTA pulmonary window, one level below will be outlet VSD. Our coronary origin for pulmonary artery, RSOV and coronary camel fistula can be there. Coming into the uh, cyanotic congenital heart disease, there are, there are three things that can happen. TOF and Eisenmenger syndromes, they have stepped down at a ventricular aortic level. Transposition physiology, as you told, that PA saturation will be greater than FA saturation. And admixture physiology, PA saturation will be equivalent to FA saturation. So if you understand these three things, most of the cyanotic congenital heart disease can be dissected out. So what are the causes of uh, right to left shunt uh, uh, happening at a uh, various levels? Uh, the step down happening at a various level. Pulmonary vein desaturation could be because of hypoventilation or a pulmonary AV fistula. For example, if it is located to one lung, only that pulmonary vein will be uh, desaturated, but rest of the pulmonary vein will have normal saturation. Lung disease and pulmonary edema. Desaturation at LA level, uh, the, 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 the pulmonary vein is adequately saturated, but desaturation is happening at LA level. That means some mixture is happening from the RA into LA. 
So that means something has to be abnormal with the RV or pulmonary artery, sia or pulmonary valve. So then this has to be Epstein's anomaly, classically tricuspid artery, sia, severe PS with TR. Or important thing is very large things, common atrium like ASD or unroofed coronary sinus. These two things you have to understand. Remember, desaturation at LV or IOT level would be TOF and Eisenmenger VSDs, and desaturation descending artery level PD and PD with quarter interruption. Coming to the pressure data, so. we have to know the normal pressures i think that is very essential so first and foremost thing that you should know is whether the pressures in all the chambers are normal or abnormal so if they are abnormal uh, what is the abnormality that means if it is pah what is the amount of ph if it is pvh what is the amount of pvh all those things you have to dissect out then very importantly you have to link pressures next in line because body is in a continuum body is in a hemodynamic continuum so you have to link pressures what i mean is that ra diastolic pressure is linked to rv diastolic pressure and diastolic pressure rv systolic pressure is linked to pa systolic pressure the pa diastolic pressure is linked to pa wedge pressure and uh, uh, pa wedge pressure is linked to lv dp and uh, lv systolic pressure is linked to aortic systolic pressure so once you start linking them immediately the gradients if they are there or if there are some fallacies of the trace for example at times people could write uh, the hemodynamically impossible like the uh, uh, the the proximal pressure uh, lower than the distal pressure all those things you have to understand then another important thing is ra has to be uh, compared the pressure in ra has to be compared with la and the pressure in rv has to be compared in lv once you do it systematically you, you invariably will find out whatever abnormality is there in the pressure tracing so you follow a logical thing like for example whether it is normal or abnormal if it is abnormal what is the abnormality then link pressures next in line and then identify gradient once you link them immediately the gradients will show up then invariably you should link ra to la and rv to lv to identify the things another method that has been suggested for saturation as well as pressure is uh, the kind of a box that i have made in the uh, right hand column where you can have a, the ra la in dark blue and svc and uh, uh, pulmonary vein and then iota and p all this can be written there and though immediately things will throw out so what is an abnormal gradient abnormal gradient uh, this is a very important thing that almost all of you should know So mean of five and any at mitral or tricuspid more than two and aortic and pulmonary is twenty five and uh, peripheral arteries it is twenty. So pH classification, I think all of you are aware. And then sometimes people ask about uh, what is in children. How do you make it in children? That is uh, based on the systemic uh, pressures. I am happy to share these slides. So I think you you, uh, you can have them. So now let us apply whatever I told you till now. What is this? It's a clinical diagnosis of tetralogy. Let us go by our systematic approach. So FA saturation is 65. Already people have given it as a tetralogy. So there is SVC, RA, RV, uh, LA, and then there is a big step down happening at LV, and then from LV to FA there is a big step down. So the saturation wise, it could be okay to have a, uh, um, a, a tetralogy like physiology. Maybe 93 LA is slightly low. Maybe there is a, a PA4 and ASD shunting also that is also producing a left to right shunt. But what is the problem like? What are the pressures like? RV pressure is high, uh, and uh, uh, LA pressure is equal to RA pressure nearly, and uh, LV is connected to FA clearly. But there is no; they have not gone into the PA. So this much we understand. But now you start linking pressures. Possibly I told you like RA is same as LA, whereas RV is higher than LV. So once you start linking pressure, immediately the diagnosis uh, turns up. So what is the diagnosis here? It is. it is a restrictive vsd so that is why the L ra pressure is slightly higher so you need not have an asd to explain possibly ra pressure could be higher because of uh, restrictive vsd producing heart failure also so it could be a tough with restrictive vsd so something for uh, thinkers like uh, what which condition in laterology physiology where the reverse happens that means the lv pressure is higher than the rv pressure that happens in only one condition that is DORV VSD PS with restrictive VSD, so that is a very very rare condition. So maybe I would have seen around four five patients till now in my twenty years of practice adult congenital heart disease. So it's a very very rare condition, but we do see them. Uh, it produces classical LV apex, uh, almost like a typical AS like picture because both the great arteries are arising from RV. So nothing is coming from LV. The only outlet for LV is the VSD, which is getting restricted. So it produces something like an LV OTO. So this is where LV pressure will be higher than the RV pressure. So three-year-old sinus since birth. We go by a systematic approach. Iota is low. Then 
once next step is to identify the patterns pa is higher than fa so clearly this is like a tga physiology if you think it's a tga physiology immediately compare the pressures like for example rv is 95 and uh, iota is 98 whereas lv is 42 and pa is 28 so basically their connections are also wrong wrong so basically this is a tga so immediately you can make out this is tga based on this so this is transposition of great arteries so beyond this beyond this what you are supposed to know is the patient is likely to have intact ventricular septum or a, or a restrictive vsd only because the rv pressures and lv pressures are so different so it has to be a restrictive vsd and uh, there has to be an adequate asd so what is the diagnosis here again there is a desaturation the cyanosis what is happening there is a big there is the pa saturation is lower than aortic saturation that means it is a normal relationship so there is no tga physiology there is no admixture physiology but then what is where is the step down happening the 95 to 82 there is a step down happening from pulmonary vein to la so this is the pressures are normal if you look at the pressures the pressures are absolutely normal this can happen as i told you uh, with a normal pressure desaturation at the la level so you have to look at atrial desaturation it could be la to ra you have to compare the pressures you have to look at pulmonary vein saturations and then it could be iatrogenic so you think of all these causes hyperventilation then you have to look at uh, the um, gases uh, pco2 lung disease uh, pulmonary fistula or epstein and roof coronary sinus these are the differential diagnosis so some some take home points are some essentials for learning so this i think i'm happy to share the slide as again i think this is the normal hemodynamics normal saturation that you expect one important thing is svc saturation of 65 to 75 is normal whenever you find an svc saturation in the presence of a normal fa saturation you should always think of a low output and you have to be very careful in catheterizing and doing an angiogram and all so this is the normal oxygen saturation and pressures these are the wave forms so you should be able to identify the characteristic wave forms the waves and all if you are shown this and then uh, the typical waves and the typical lv to iota pullback uh, the how the lv pressure traces changes to iota uh, pressure trace all those things are very nicely uh, shown in this one important question that commonly asked is how do you differentiate between rv and the lv Pressure from the pressure trace itself. So pressure trace is generally the RV is triangular in shape. Upstroke is not that rapid. You can see compare both the things. And then there is a uh, yearly fall and the pressure levels uh, falls to zero, which never happens in uh, LV. And there is no sustained peak in RV. So these are differences. So I think I can't go into the details of operability, but I, you have to understand that dissolved oxygen has to be taken into account. Uh, I think uh, once you, for example, in this patient with, which looks like quite operable, but baseline PVR is 15.8. Even with oxygen, the PVR came down to 6.4. But once you use dissolved oxygen into consideration in oxygen study, the PVR is 10 units. It's a real life situation. so commonly what are the criteria for operability i think this slide summarizes almost all the important criteria that you should know i think uh, uh, you can have this and then this will be a very good chart to follow what you should do with various levels uh, i think this is published in the uh, the recent guidelines of uh, european uh, uh, congenital heart disease association so some basic traces so this is a common trace that is thrown in up, uh, to you in the exams so uh, invariably there is a confusion is it supravalvular or valvular or is it subvalvular so i always tell my students to look at the types of trace so the, there are three types of trace here one is a clear ventricular type of trace another one is a clear arterial type of trace and another one is a clear arterial type of trace so there is a gradient is happening between artery to arterial type of trace then this has to be supravalvular as so this is classical supravalvular as so this is the uh this is another thing is commonly asked is like uh, uh, is it hocm or not so invariably one hour something like this is shown invariably people answer this is hocm but this is actually not hocm it is a fixed obstruction because the pulse pressure did not change here that is very essential and this is a pullback uh, in the rvot so mpa to rvot and then rv infundibulum you can see a gradient happening between r ventricle to ventricle type of trace then this has to be a infundibular type of narrowing whereas here the pullback is happening at the valvular level you can clearly nicely see this is valvular ps so this is some some important traces that you should understand is uh, uh, this is uh, uh, acute severe mr uh, uh, following ptmc and then uh, there is no gradient in this patient with uh, severe mr the valve area is written is 0.6 the explanation is there's a huge step up from svc to ra there is no gradient so that means it is a lutenbacher syndrome so all these things you can go through i will be sharing the slides so 
uh, coming to uh, the end of my presentation, I think always uh, compare uh, the stepwise approach for saturation, cyanotic or acyanotic. If it is cyanotic, identify the patterns. Either it has to be an admixture physiology where PA is equal to FA and almost all the chambers will have the same saturation beyond the chamber of mixing. TGA physiology, PA will be higher than FA and uh, other physiologies will be, uh, uh, the PA will be lower than FA. Then in that case, you should look at where the step down is happening, at what level it is happening. I have told you the reasons for step down. If it is an acyanotic annular heart disease, look at where the step up is happening. And the pressure data, always look at normal to abnormal, link pressures next in line, immediately gradients will come up. Always compare RV to uh, LV and RA to LA. With this, I think almost all uh, traces that are prone to you will be, you will be able to answer Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Rama. Uh, uh, I think you have absolutely summarized in the right time. And then, of course, uh, it would have been really interesting had it been an interactive session, because then uh, we would have known that how much the students also know. But this is one of the drawbacks of uh, virtual platform that where uh, probably we have to do a monologue rather than a dialogue. So thanks once again, Rama. And uh, now moving on, uh, the, the next topic is the segmental approach to valvular heart disease by uh, echocardiography. I invite uh, Dr. Hiten Shah uh, from Mumbai to speak on this topic. Dr. Hiten. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, a nice opportunity to have an interactive section uh, on the face of the examiner annually. And uh, definitely, it is not only the students, for us also, it is a good learning experience. As we know, the patient with valvular heart disease can be present with a wide variety of the symptoms. They could be asymptomatic or uh, any kind of symptoms, which is very difficult to correlate with the severity of the uh, lesion. So echocardiography plays a very important role as act as a complementary for not only to understand the valve structure functions and the, uh, also the physiology of the valve structure. And uh, it is also useful not only in the, the critically ill, but also as a bedside mobility uh, in ambulatory patients. As we know, the mitral valve anatomy consists of annulus, cauda, leaflet, and the papillary muscles and the underlying bonds. Uh, M mode, the 2D echo is not only the putting the color. Ma'am, please. Sorry. Line mode? Yes. Can you make it? Uh, Hello? Madam, put it on full slide mode, ma'am. Full screen, screen, madam, please. Okay, yeah, just full screen mode, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Now? Huh. Yeah. So, uh, sorry. Huh. So we have to not only see the colors, but we have to focus the M mode, 2D, 3D, and the transesophageal echo. And all this modality act as a complementary to understand the structure and the functions uh, better. As we know that M mode is it's a lost art, but it is it was the one of the earliest eco technique to evaluate the mitral valve abnormalities and we should know each valve's m mode in detail because sometimes the examiner asks you to draw and not only for the exams but in your practice if you're dealing with a disproportionate valve area and the symptoms this m mode definitely help you to take uh, the judgment about the severity of the lesion the mitral valve consists of uh, the mitral valve, uh, here we uh, not only see the AML and the PML, but uh, we can size the duration of the valve in the systole and the diastole. The, you can see very well on the screen, the DEF slope and the AC slope in the systole and where a CD line, uh, 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 it is in diastole, whereas a CD line, it is in the systole. So in a patient with SAM, there is a systolic anterior motion. So you can see the systolic event, the CD line goes upwards towards the uh, septum. Whereas in patients with MVP, that uh, it is below, uh, as the valve is prolapsing, though it is below the baseline. 
and uh, there is a bali yesterday we had taken exams and uh, the, the candidate was not knowing about the b pump b pump is also uh, at the ac shoulder where you can see in a patient but increased lvdp or a lv dysfunction so m mode is obviously a very important tool to understand and uh, know the severity of the lesion now uh, about the mitral stenosis severity we can assess by the planimetry the pressure on the doppler by the pressure gradient the area by the pressure of time and the pisa the planimetry always uh, most of the time the, the candidate makes a mistake or the clinician makes a mistake to see at the midway level and then you can give the justice to the wall area so always measured cross sectional area at the leaflet tip and it should be in the mid diastole the pressure up time it is a time integral which allows the transmetal gradient to follow by the half of its calculated from the dc deceleration slope and it helps if it is a uh, 100 times then the area would be uh, around 2 and uh, if it is a uh, 220 then area would be 1 so it it can uh, uh, we can measure the metropolitan area by measuring the pressure up time at deceleration slope this is again a demonstration of uh, how we can take the peak gradients the trace the doppler signal the pressure of time and this is a 3d today's are up the clinicians and the surgeons point of view one should be aware of the 3d all anterior and the posterior mitral leaflet the anatomy a, uh, you can see it divides into a1 a2 a3 p1 p2 p3 is a beautifully demonstration of the severity of lesion on the 3d echo so in general the mitral wall area severity can be uh, mild moderate and severe according to the area gradient and the uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure the wilkinson score it is a very important score to determine if the mitral wall area is visible mitral wall is visible for the balloon Uh, and your uh, balloon valvoplasty or not and here there are the four modalities the um, mobility thickening cordon involvement and the calcification and if the score is less than or equal to 8 then the, uh, it is an excellent candidate for the balloon mitral valvotomy transesophageal echocardiography it is a very important tool and it has a uh, almost 100% specificity and 97% sensitivity for understanding the uh, clot and the ruling out the clot into the LA and these are the various grading of clot according to the locations and uh, the severity of the clot now about the mitral regurgitation the regurgitation lesion it has a pathological abnormality on the, it could be either it could be either a primary or uh, it could be either sir it could be either primary or secondary and a uh, primary is usually because of the leaflet and uh, uh, the corda whereas a secondary is because of the uh, due to the la or lv size this is a carpenter classifications where uh, uh, where you can see the if the lip type one is if leaflet is normal and only annular dilatations or perforations the mr can present whereas a flail leaflet or excessive leaflet movement it is type 2 whereas in type 3 it is the thickening and a, a restricted leaflet motion if it is restricted only in cystic then we should suspect a ischemic mr whereas uh, uh, others are restricted in cystic as well as the diastole now the color flow doppler one should see any regurgitation lesions these are the three important parameters one should look for the jet area the la area and the flow convergence and the vena contracta width this is a beautiful picturization how uh, the flow convergence the jet area line and the vena contracta uh, one can uh, evaluate on the echo vena the jet area is obviously a very easy method and it is more safe uh, simple and the reliable when readily available you can zoom the area of uh, which chamber the wall is leaking and you can uh, take the jet area uh, with the ratio of uh, with the uh, total chamber area 
but the only problem is in a patient with the eccentric trait and here you have to adjust the gain set setting the flow convergence it is also a quantitative method where the lesion severity we can diagnose and uh, according to the the hemisphere radius we can uh, judge the severity of the lesion the vena contractor it is here you are seeing only the depth of the uh, the width of the uh, narrow is jack and here it is again a very uh, 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 effective method to know the severity of the lesion and here the only limitation is if there are multiple jacks you can under you can't uh, estimate the vena contractor width in that uh, valvular regurgitation the pisa the pisa is a uh, very important tool where uh, here uh, the proximal isovalve the any regurgitant orifice which travel through a narrow orifice it forms a hemicircle and it is a law of conversion and here it gives not only the uh, flow conversion but it, uh, we can give uh, measure the regurgitant volume and the ero area and that again will help it into the Uh, uh, judging the severity of the lesion, and uh, definitely here you have to focus the aqueous limit, and that is also an important tool to calculate the PISA. This is a demonstration how we can calculate the PISA uh, in a day-to-day -day practice, and it is very easy, and one should start practicing it so we can give more justice to the valvular lesion. This is a pulse wave Doppler, which is again a quantitative and a semi-quantitative method, where it depends on the dominances. If A wave dominance, then it rule out MR, whereas E wave dominance, it indicates uh, there is a possibility of a severe MR. And the pulmonary vein flip, the systolic flow reversal, is again indicated of the severe MR. This is a beautiful uh, picturization about the eccentric jet MR. Which indicates a severe, and here the the jet is adherent to the wall of the LA, and that is called as a Kondas effect. So, to judge the severity of the MR, one should not only there are three type of uh, segmental approach. One is a qualitative, second thing is quantitative. In quantitative, the semi quantitative and the quantitative. The qualitative is you have to just see the. Before putting any color to the uh, 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 to the uh, structure, one should see the leaflet, the annular size, the corda morphology, the LV and the LA size. That is, uh, and the pulmonary vein flow profile. Whereas quantitative method, in the semi-quantitative method, we can see the vena contracta, ERO, and the regurgitant volume. Whereas uh, in a quantitative method, uh, we can uh, see the size of the LA, LV. And the TR function. This is a flow chart. How we can go uh, and uh, diagnose various lesions uh, depending on the uh, all the parameters. And uh, those who are having a more than mild MR, in that this quantitative method of Doppler assessment is mandatory to know the exact severity of the lesion. And today's we are having a era of a metric clipping and. Here, the echocardiography plays a very important role, whether it is favorable for intervention or unfavorable. And these are the parameters we have to judge and rule out whether we are dealing with a primary or secondary MR. And according to the uh, dimensions, one can take whether it is suitable and it is contraindicated for the intervention surgery. This is a demonstration about the severe mitral regurgitation, and this. This is how PISA we can calculate. Now a word about the aortic wall. Aortic wall is the primary uh, wall disease where most of commonly affected and uh, rheumatic. It could be it is a three leaflet structure, but in a bicuspid aortic wall, it is a two leaflet. Whereas a rheumatic usually there is a commissural fusion and it is. A multiple uh, wall involvement. Isolated rheumatic aortic wall is very rare. I, I think incidence is less than eight percent compared to the uh, 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 multivalvular lesion in a rheumatic etiology. Whereas calcific is usually a 
patients above 75 today's the tower era you can see more geriatric populations are getting uh, uh, tower done because of the calcific involvement of the aortic lutein now to judge the severity of the lesion one should know first of all the in the plex view one should know where your cursor is the you have to measure the lvot the sinotubular junctions i i uh, to the isotic aorta and then it definitely it's a helpful in evaluating the cross sectional area of the aortic wall and uh, for the lvot to a aortic stenosis that's a velocity for lvot you have to put the uh, pulse wave dop doppler in a apical core chamber view and uh, just inside the lv cavity uh, above from the aortic wall whereas in a uh, aortic wall uh, velocity you have to put a cw and you have to trace the whole envelope and one can calculate the uh, aortic wall area by continuity equations uh, uh, cross sectional area of the lvot into multiplied by vti of lvot and the vti of aortic wall those nowadays there is a term called dimensionless index that uh, is helpful and it doesn't require but a cross sectional area so it is more specific and you have to just uh, divide the lvot velocity z and the vti and the uh, aortic wall z velocity and this is a standard grading of aortic wall i think this slide you will get it in a, a, a as a in a pen drive so i am not going to utter all, all these things but uh, this is a flow chart if we are dealing with the low gradient how we can go all the doppler signals and we can uh, uh, come to the conclusion yeah, are we dealing with a severe as or it is a, a low pressure gradient now aortic wall regurgitation as ar results this is a carpenter classification again which shows the there is a normal cusp or prolapsed cusp or a restricted cusp any regurgitation lesion these are the three basic mechanisms once you know the mechanism then the, your diagnosis and the, is very easy so in a type 1a there is only the enlargement at the level of the ascending aorta whereas type 2b at the sinus valsalva uh, or sinotubular junction there is a dilatation and that leads to incomplete coaptation whereas a uh, type 1c it is at the ventricular arterial level and type b is there is a perforation and the restricted movement leads to type 3 uh, ar and this is again i would emphasize on m mode which is very important the box pattern of the aortic wall and here you can diagnose austin plain murmur beautifully by seeing the flutter waves on the uh, m mode of the aortic wall this is again a bicuspid aortic wall you can rule out by seeing the closer line is eccentric now the doppler method again all these three principles which we had discussed at the metal regurgitation the pulse wave color flow and the continuous flow and you have to zoom the area of interest and you have to see the jet area jet area line and uh, the uh, ratio and this is again a uh, flow convergence you have to measure the radius this is a 3d demonstrations about the aortic wall in co cooptations uh, and uh, this is a pulse wave doppler you can see the holo diastolic uh, reversal of the flow this is classically seen in the echo the pressure of time lesser the pressure of time more the severe the er so i i just conclude the severity of er from this uh, this thing is if vena contracta is more than 0.6 whereas in mitral regurgitation it should be more than 0.7 the jet width to lvot area should be more than six, equal to 65 regurgitation fraction should be more than or equal to 50 the pressure half time should be less than 200 there should be lv dilatation and eroa uh, is should be less than or equal to 0.3 then we are dealing with a severe er now a word about the tricuspid wall the tricuspid is, is the, the largest wall apically located there are three leaflets the anterior posterior and the septal and uh, we have to 
there are various modalities apart from eco there is a cardiac mri and the ct there is a role for uh, um, uh, knowing the anatomy of the tricuspid valve and uh, right heart before we quantify the tr severity we should know what is the hemodynamics so the right ventricular function is very important the tapsy plays a very important and everybody should know how to take the tapsy and if, if it is less than 1.6 the we are dealing with the rv dysfunction this is a tissue doppler which are the other way we can judge the right ventricular functions this is uh, how we can take the tapsy in day to day practice now the about the right atrial pressure always like uh, we are uh, screening uh, while well doing the echo uh, always screen from the abdomen and see the ivc and it should be uh, uh, usually perpendicular and uh, we should take after the hepatic vein origin and it should be uh, and these are the hemodynamics mix of the ra pressure if it is collapsing uh, dilated and more than or 50% collapsing and we can uh, judge the severity and uh, what is the exactly ra pressure is dealing with this is a, a right ventricular systolic pressure you can trace the tr that and add the ra pressures and you can get the right ventricular systolic pressure and according to that severity one can know we are dealing with the right sided pressure overload or volume overload and this is our word about the pulmonary valve so i just before i conclude i just say the severe tr severe tr not only judged by the uh, the tr jet velocity but the dilatation of the annulus the more than 50% jet occupancy into the ra the vena contracta which should be more than or equal to 0.7 dilated rv and there is a hepatic flow reversal uh, uh, systolic flow reversal you can see in a, a hepatic vein and then you are dealing with the severe t or organic tr now the pulmonary valve this is a very important valve and uh, in a congenital uh, uh, heart disease and here you should know not only you have to see the valve leaflet but the annulus the rvot the infundibular anatomy so always put before putting a color you have to see your 2d imaging first you have to see what what chamber you are looking for what what is the abnormality according and here you can see the aortic root and the pulmonary artery sizes comparison and then you are uh, okay whether you are dealing with the dilatations or a stenotic lesion this is again a m mode of the uh, pulmonary valve where you can diagnose not only the ps ph but also the infundibular obstruction as well as the idiopathic dilatation of the pulmonary artery and this is a flow chart about the grading of the severity of the pulmonary stenosis and uh, if it is the uh, more than 64 it is a severe and if it is only the valvular then it is a candidate for the bpv but if it is a subvalvular or dysplastic valve then one should defer the intervention and uh, lastly the word about the pulmonary regurgitation the pulm pr also plays a very important role and uh, here if the severe pr uh, this is a chart where you can differentiate the mild moderate and severe but i just say if regurgitant fraction is more than 50% then one should suspect a severe pr and uh, if any thing in dilemma for rvot better visualization sometimes adult patients if there are crowded rooms and you can see the rvot better and you are suspecting a severe volume overload because of pr and rvot then you have to consider a cardiac mri thank you thank you dr hiten i completely agree that you know you have nicely covered uh, how the segmental approach to valve disease and especially as you said rightly that mr assessment pisa they, we have been studying all the students study but when it comes to application they hardly are applying it so yeah, we all are I, like uh, think it is a time consuming and all, but it is easy and we can calculate it huh? absolutely absolutely it's especially helpful in a patient with more than mild mr so yeah. either you are uh, giving justice to conserve or you can be aggressive to prevent the future progression
so i i believe the student should learn these uh, the tips these are the very important tips and then you know they are helpful in their day to day practice later on it is just not the exam so thank you once again doctor thank you thank you so moving on and uh, now it's me who will be uh, talking on the the basics and beyond can i share the screen yeah yes sir okay am i visible now it's these slides are visible yes sir okay so okay thank you yeah so so basically like uh, uh, the basics and beyond and today the reason why i uh, picked up this topic is that uh, primarily all those who are sitting there in the the hall uh, in in their uh, all the students who are participating uh, they are all uh, uh, like basically intervention cardiologists anti analysts proved otherwise because today every cardiologist who is part, passing out uh, they want to become an intervention cardiologist and they are and i have seen because my center is there which we train lot of post dm fellows in my place for the last many years and uh, every cardiologist every intervention especially the dm fresh dm he wants to learn the angioplasty within first 6 months and start his practice um, it's very good uh, but i feel that uh, the the certain fundamental things are uh, we have to pick it up and uh, as rama said it put it rightly that it is not just the passing of this examination you have much tougher exam in your life when you do the wednesday you start doing a day to day practice uh, because here you can do a correction there you can't do any correction so i i urge all of you that you know at least pay some attention to this this may be helpful because now again the examination pattern is also changing uh, from uh, like yesterday you heard that you know the the importance for the different sounds murmurs clicks and other things but as now nowadays we are giving a virtual cases mostly the examination part is uh, got over and uh, probably the the uh, concentration would be more on the the echo scales and the angio and the oximetry uh, the interpretation so so any center which is taking a primary angioplasty must have uh, one second please this sharing view is a little uh, okay this this causing me trouble okay anyway so basically i wanted to say that uh, any center which is undertaking a primary angioplasty must have at least a cardiac catheterization equipped with physiological measurements systems and full facilities for cpr the need for particular items of angioplasty hardware such as balloons guiding catheters stents and adjunctive pharmacotherapy often cannot be anticipated until a procedure is in progress so i suggest, uh, suggest that all of you must prepare before you do and i always compare it with like something like a, a checklist implementation of checklist to be used for medical procedures are similar to the rule of in aviation industry you must have seen that you know every time you sit in the flight and then you know everybody has boarded but still pilot and the ground engineer takes his with his own sweet time because it's basically that's the way they do a checklist every every part of the aviation uh, the uh, the flight is checked and then it takes off so similarly we also should plan i urge all my fellows also whenever you're getting into the cath lab before doing just don't go and which artery you have to do an angioplasty and then go ahead with the procedure but please plan it please check everything whatever is available or not and then go for the procedure so it's something like this the every qualified cardiologist is like a new unit once they enter into the cath lab and majority of times the situation is something like this it's like a road block we really don't know uh, what to do whether we should go for a bypass surgery we should come out of the lab or we should really do all these other methods so so standard equipments i'm not going into their pci hardware but uh the other things which you must ensure into the lab before you get into that is a covered stents 
pericardio synthesis materials, retrieval devices, temporary pacemaker with wires and cables, protection devices and aspiration devices. Trust me, uh, I've been practicing aggressive intervention for the last 25, 27 years. And uh, I needed each one of them in my practice. And many times, you know, I say that it is criminal to uh, use the cath lab or start a cath lab without having a covered stent in your shelf. So please make sure because you never know when you land up there and when you perforate it and then, you know, you run here and there. And if you don't put a covered stand at that moment of time, definitely you will lose a patient. You, can, you don't have time generally to send the patient for a CEVG or anything like, like that. Pericardiosynthesis, again, a very, very common thing, especially when you're doing a BMVs. Um, so you do perforate and then you, know, you develop a huge pericardial tamponade and that is again in an emergency and you should, be, you should have your material and then you should be Equint, you should be used to that, to how to drain the pericardial fluid. Retrieval devices, again, often the most of the Indian cath labs, like you do use ox material and whenever you use an ox material, there is chances that, you know, I did have this problem because in fact, I was doing a, a live case to Singapore and then, you know, during live case itself, my catheter tip broke out and it went into the distal LED. So the retrieval devices, again, which is a must in almost all the cath labs. Temporary pacemaker, needless to say that you need to check your wires and cables. Many times the patient gets arrested, you put a temporary sheet and your pacemaker is not there and you run here and there, the whole staff runs and you lose the patient. So protection devices, again, are very important when you're doing a venous angioplasty, especially post cabbage, you're getting a lot of acute MIs and you're trying to do a primary in a, in a venous graft. Usually there is a huge thrombus burden. In those situations, you require a protection device. And the aspiration, of course, uh, is, is a must for almost all the primaries. Similarly, you need to check your hemodynamic monitorings and defibrillators before you really start. And uh, these are all the things which are required. Uh, the one thing which can be asked in the thing is that many times they put a simple sheet and they don't allow you to touch and then ask you what, num what size of the sheet is. So please be uh, aware of it that uh, the length in almost all the, the, the cath lab uh, instrumentation, your lengths are usually used in centimeters and sizes are usually in French. And so remember this, that four French is red colored. The knob is always colored. The, by the color of the knob, you can make out that uh, which size is the thing. So four French is a red color, five French is a gray, six French is green. That's what you often see. Seven French is an orange. And that is the reason many times, you know, I just see the knob of it. And then I know whether a patient, sister has put a six French or a seven French sheet, because that's very critically important. If you're doing a primary angioplasty, I often go with a seven French sheet rather than going with a six French, because many times you may have to do uh, multiple wires, multiple balloons and other things. So it is always preferable to use a seven French. And that's how you see with an orange color knob of this sheet. So eight French is a blue color and nine French is a gray. And when you have a striped lines, that means a half sizes, it could be a seven and a half, nine and a half, and ten and a half, although it's very really little rare. And uh, what is this French thing is? So, uh, basically French is a correct term is a chariot. Uh, the French urologist who basically uh, used it for, to propose for the standard urinary catheters. And uh, I think all of you are aware of it, the, the, the relationship between the diameter radius and the circumference. Su circumference. The ratio of pi is equal to the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. And so the circumference divided by diameter gives you a pi. So, uh, so that is how the whole thing is by one French is, is equal to one third of a millimeter. And to rule of thumb is, if you have a six French catheter, it's a two millimeters. And if you have a nine French catheter, it's basically a three millimeters. It's important because many times uh, uh, you do the, the stent pickup, you size the stent uh, in a vessel according to the catheter which is being used because you, you can see in the views that you have a catheter which is passing through and you know what size of the catheter is, suppose it's a seven French or eight French, you know the, what is the size of the, the relative size of the catheter and then you can assess your lesion. So you must know this conversion of that six French is equal to two, two millimeters and nine French is three millimeters. Uh, that's how it is. And they, I'm not going to go, so today I'll basically cover the wires and the catheters. The, these are the two things which I would be covering it. Uh, the, again, I'm not going into the, the, the technical part of it, how is it constructed and other things, but uh, primarily there are three things which are the stainless steel, dura steel, and nitinol. Nowadays, most of them are through nitinol because uh, of course the, it is more uh, flexible and then it has got a huge strength compared to the dura steel or the other st st SS. 
So the wires are again, you know, it's a two types, straight tipped and the J tip. Majority of the people don't know why the straight tip is because straight tip is used in certain particular situations where you can use it. And when you have a chronic lesion, when you have very, very tight lesion, probably sometimes you can use that straight tip. And otherwise, again, the tip can be fixed and movable. That is also a one sign which if you're not working in the cat lab, you will not be able to know that you can actually um, straighten the, the J tip if you apply a little bit of a pressure in the, in the, in the distal segment. So, and more important is an exchange guide wire because this is again a very important thing that sometimes you go ahead with an angioplasty and then you realize halfway that, you know, this guide is not fitting and then you really want to really exchange the guide wire. So at that moment of time, you should be well aware that these, these wires are important. There are certain BMW wires are the one which can be exchanged wires because you can put a connector behind and you can extend the length of it and you can exchange the guides or catheters or whatever it is. So, the diameter is basically again a thousand of an inch is the way the diameters are measured. It ranges from 0.014 to 0.038 depending on the different wires. So different diameter, uh, the guide wires are available and you should be acquainted with those guide wires uh, for a different purposes because it gives you a different strength. Of course, the PTCA guide wire is usually a 0 0.014 inch guide wire. The, and usually the length is always, as I said at the beginning, that it is described in, in centimeters. So 80 to 110 centimeters, they usually vary. And normally most of the catheters are of 100, 100 centimeters or 110 centimeters. Again, this becomes important because there are certain lesions, certain places, whether you're new, you're not very sure whether your catheter is going to reach there or not, especially if you're doing a peripheral angioplasties. So this length it should be kept in mind when you're proceeding with these interventions. So what do the guide wires do? So I always feel the guide wire is like, you know, a road in ghats because it is uh, somehow I always feel whenever you go for a drive, a, a ghat road drive. So it is always quite twisted and other things and where you are uh, probably a car or you have huge truck, which is your stand, which needs to be uh, sent to the, the last part. So that is how it becomes, it, it becomes very difficult in those roads. Similarly, the guide wire also does the same thing. So it tracks through the vessel, access and crosses the lesion, supports intervention devices for various procedures. These are the four terms which are often used and you should be aware of it, which are often uh, in day-to-day -day practice, we use it, but people are not really uh, 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 thorough about it that what exactly torqueability, stirability, pushability and tracking is. Torqueability is torque is the response of the wire to the turning by the operator. So that is how it is. Then uh, how much the operator is turning from the outside and how much the wire is, uh, is moving, that's the, is, uh, is responding is the torqueability of the wire. Steerability is the ability and responsiveness of the wire tip to navigate. So again, the important thing is me, you, the tip is the most thing because if you really want to get into a particular branch, the tip has to move around and there that depends on the steerability of the wire. Pushability is the amount of the force needed to advance the wire and tracking is the ability of the wire body to follow the, the tip around the bends. So that is an important thing because you could, some, if the wire is not trackable, but it has got a good flip, good tip. So you might be able to enter it, but it doesn't get through that. It doesn't like extend start through your push to the wire uh, which, because of the good steerability, but the tracking is not good, so it will not go down. So then that, that's the time the wire comes out of it. So these are the few things which are practically used in day-to-day -day practice. You should be aware of these things. Sometimes you can be asked what these different things are. Now, selecting a guide wire, guide, guide wire specific, uh, select a guide wire to specifically match a clinical situation. So these are the four things. The front line are workhorse wire, tortuous anatomy, you have an extra support, or you have a chronic occlusion. Uh, I would always say that every operator should stick to one or two guide wires, two PTCA wires, because there are hundreds of wires that are available just because you have seen a wire somewhere in some conference or some meeting and some operator has used it. So you start using it tomorrow or some company guy has come and he has briefed you and then you start using it. It's not a good practice. I would say that always get used to one particular wire or two particular wire. You start talking to the wire after working for 25, 30 years, I can tell you that there is a stage when you really start communicating with your wire, you know where the wire is, if the there is completely closed channel also also, you are well aware with by the tactile feel and by the, the way the wire moves, you can make out whether the patient you are in the channel or you are out of the channel. So always start using with a, a, a workhorse wire. It should have the qualities of often uh, select favorite wire, flexible and steering, small 
diameters are more flexible large diameter are basically gives you more support in torqueability soft tip these are the few things which should be picked up while uh, selecting your workhouse wire and if you have a uh, a tortuous vessel requires exceptional steering and tracking capabilities without prolapse shorter tapers will have a prolapse longer tapers usually will have a good traction but again if you have a longer tapers then it becomes a difficult to have the 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 tactile sensation so there are every there is no ideal wire available in the in the world today even now so there are certain things which you gain and certain things you lose so it depends what exactly you you are aiming for and according to that you should select your wires the steerability tracking tip control and support these are the four things which normally i take into the consideration when you re i really have to cross a tortuous anatomy like this when you can see almost a, a 360 degrees turn out turn of the rca there and but still with a good wire you can go through that if you want the body wire this is again a very common term uh, when uh, sometimes you you cross the lesion to do everything but many times your balloon or the stent may not go down so probably you need uh, an extra support either you can take a hard wire or if you don't have an hard wire you have already crossed with a soft tip wire or something a, a flexible wire then probably you can put another wire to support uh, the which is a, usually a second wire and we call it as a body wire so which again helps you uh, track down the the your balloons and uh, and the stents to the lesion so higher level of support for straightening vessel and assisting with device delivery is the thing in uh, when you need a support and of course cto is altogether a different ball game uh, it's not for the beginners at all to venture into this field but again there are tip controls including in lesions variable tip stiffnesses taper tips so i would say that just have a, an idea about it and uh, and you should be able to know the different types of wires i'm not going into because they are from the different companies they depending on the the tip weight of the the tip uh, like there are 3 grams 6 grams 9 grams and other things you should be able to know which wire works in in which particular condition and sometimes uh, during the and uh, during your exams they may just put a sheet or a wire and they can ask you to a different questions because you have been working every day and what are the complications of the guide wire you can do a plaque embolization you can do an arterial perforation you can do an acute vessel closure you can have a subintimal wire replacements wire fractures and wide wire tip entrapment and again um, uh, i have done everything okay i have faced all the complications whatever i have mentioned here because i did have uh, everything many times you know you have soft plaque and you have embolized it and it, the distal flow is completely gone perforations are very common you do a land up with an arterial perforation of course not with a wire but usually with a balloon dilatations but yes it is common acute vessel closures are again many times a primary you are doing it you go ahead, get into the false lumen and you do anything uh, the vessel doesn't close the vessel doesn't get open at all and it gets completely closed and subintimal wire replacements are again common thing so wire fractures are again so i would say that please it is not just for the enumeration purpose one gum, one uh, comes across all these situation in day to day practice so you should be aware of these complications as well so select a guide wire to specifically match a clinical situation your guide wire will set the platform for the remainder of the case because once your wire is done maybe almost 70% of the, the 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 procedure is done appropriate guide wire selection can make it easier to overcome difficult clinical scenarios Oh, another important thing that you have connected it, you have you are doing a procedure, and suddenly you find out that your BP is falling down, and other things. You are trying every measure, and you don't really understand what exactly happened. You start nodded, you start dopamine, and other things. But many times, it's a very simple things that basically your transducer location has changed. Some your technician inadvertently has moved out, and then probably it has gone down, or probably there is air in the circuit. So these are the few basic things which you should be aware when while doing a procedure, even simple an angiogram to the a very complex angioplasty. now coming to the catheters uh, the uh, right heart catheters and other and left heart catheters left catheters i've seen uh, again i said that lot of dm fellow post dm fellows they join me and in the last couple of years i asked them they said uh, we hardly and i've seen that hardly they are doing a right heart cath although rama has taken such a nice uh, thing on oximetry uh, i hardly see in the day to day practice and this is one catheter right heart catheter i don't know how many of you can uh, identify what this catheter is it is a swan gange catheter and um, it was very often during our early days during our uh, fellow uh, residency days we used to use this uh, very often Uh, and uh, it's a balloon flotation catheter 
it's a very important catheter because this is one catheter uh, which can be used on bedside okay you don't require a cath lab to use it and then you know it's a bedside thing where you can uh, know exactly what is your pulmonary wedge pressure sir or what is the pulmonary artery pressure sir so one should be used to it. one should uh, uh, get used to this and i suggest of course there was uh, there was so much of overuse of this uh, swan gange catheter that it became the word became almost like a verb so we used to call the swandit or not so swandit means okay the patient already had a swan gange catheter there so but of course again a trial was done rct was done with the swan gange catheter and they said it was not necessarily proved very useful in almost all the patients who are coming into cicu for uh, swan ganging but what i would suggest is you should be aware of it so it's a balloon flotation catheter the tip of the balloon the is the one which floats the according to the because of the flow of the the blood from ra to rv into the pa and uh, the the part is you can see that it has got a markers there this is every marker is a 10 cm apart and so you can know the, what is the length of the 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 catheter which has gone in so you have three routes either you can go by the subclavian or you can go through an internal jugular or you can go through a femoral vein most likely you can go through a sub uh, internal jugular or you can go through a, a, a subclavian usually subclavian is 10 to 15 cm when you get, get into uh, uh, ra and if you are into jugular it is basically between 15 to 20 cm you get into ra and how do you know so these are the four ports are available uh, this is the red port is basically for the inflating the balloon uh, it's usually you use a 0.5 to 1.5 ml of air or liquid so that you can uh, you know inflate the balloon and this is the the yellow port is basically for the pressures because it will give us the the pressure monitor and that is how it does it you know how do you know that because you connect it there and uh, the pressure monitor the the pressure waves are very distinct for ra rv and pa and pulmonary wedge and that's how you can know that and if you are suppose if it is coiled around so you bring you pull back the catheter and again put it back and so that's how you you get the pressure and you can uh, seat your catheter into the pulmonary wedge or pulmonary artery and these are the two ones which basically the the venous pressure this is one which which gives you central venous pressure all the time and the fourth one clear catheter a clear way is basically used for uh, giving drugs so in case if you really want to give certain directly into the pulmonary artery uh, so you can give the uh, drugs through this so this is a swan gange catheter i would request all of you be aware, be uh, uh, acquainted with this because another one is a nih and kunard these are the two ones kunard is an end hole catheter and nih a side hole catheter kunard is usually used to to basically check the pressures because you have an end hole there and uh, the the nih is usually do use for injecting the rv or ra and other things so get used to those catheters so moving on the other guide catheters because it's already i'm uh, i had to sum it up and uh, the selection of a guide catheter is elementary but an issue of extreme importance in performance of perpendicular pcis uh, this is very important compared to diagnostic catheter guiding guiding catheters has a stiffer shift larger internal diameter a shorter and more angulated tip and reinforced construction so uh, you must be wondering that you know sometimes you use a six french Uh, diagnostic cath and six french guiding cath but you can, have you ever tried passing a stent through a six french diagnostic catheter whereas the uh, the in compared to the the guiding catheter because the internal diameter of diagnostic catheters are smaller compared to the internal diameter of the guiding catheters it's very very important to note because i don't have a time but i will show you one case where we did a, a guideless left main angioplasty where i had no guide but just went on the wire because that was a problem the diagnostic cath will not allow a stent there and no other guide was able to sit there the internal diameter of diagnostic cath is, is of 6 inch is 0.1 1.40 mm whereas the the stent minimum stent size is 1.4 to 1.46 and above so that is the reason you can't use a diagnostic catheter for passing on the stents and balloons so this should be aware of it that the internal diameter is usually large larger for a uh, guiding cats and uh, the general larger size allows you better opacification of the contrast better guide support and allow pressure monitoring albeit uh, at a cost of increased risk of osteal trauma vascular complication and possibility of kinking of catheter shaft so that's the the disadvantage of a, a hard thing and as i said beginning there are usually three layers the central layer is a steel stainless steel braided layer which makes the the catheter stiffer but it gives you a support excellent support and uh, it doesn't kink 
So types of catheters, Judkin, Saplage, Pictel, Multipurpose, Bypass, and Edstones. Again, um, as the time passes, you will start using all of them. And the normal, the workhorse catheters are Judkins. Uh, is extremely useful as a diagnostic catheter because of its primary curve. Uh, I'll just tell you what the primary curve and secondary curves are. Therefore, it is intubates only a small segment of ostium into the either left main or RCA and thus carries a less risk of trauma to these vessels. However, the same property causes a serious limitation while performing a PCI. So the, the, the thing is that because of this primary curve, it goes and sets, it doesn't really get intubated deep inside, but because of the, during the angioplasty, uh, it doesn't become the, the pair, the target vessel and the primary vessel are, are the catheter, they are not coaxial, and many times you're not able to perform the, the procedures with the Jatkins. So since primary curve is fixed, the catheter may not be coaxial, that's what is written. With Jatkin catheters, the point of contact is narrow and higher up, and the iota contributing to the weak back support. So that is what happens many times you may, Sometimes you use a Judkins guiding catheter, but problem is the you might be able to see the good artery, but majority of times it may not support you to put your the the devices down. Amplas is again again a beautiful catheter, uh, but it requires a little bit of an experience to use this. Uh, M plus type of catheter base of the sweeping secondary curve is intended to rest on the aortic root. I'll just show you the next pictures. This is what it is. So you can see here this is the primary curve, and this primary curve is. Uh, uh, is a fixed curve, which is basically the, the, the target vessel with the parent vessel. And this is called the secondary curve, which is the width of the, the, the aorta. So, so different sizes, depending on this secondary curve length is 3.54 or 4.5 and 5 and so on. And similarly here on the right side also. And you can see here that if you have a small narrow cat aorta, you use a 3.5, you have widened aorta, you normally use a 4 or 4.5. And uh, as I said, that Amplage, Amplage is, a, is again a very excellent catheter. Again, requires a little bit of a skill. And here you can see this whole secondary curve sits onto the root of the aortic, uh, aorta and it gives you an excellent support. And here you can see the only one thing, word of caution in Amplage cannulation is that if once it sits and after that, if you try to remove it, if you just pull it back, in fact, the tip is going to go inside. So it's going to damage the left main. So be very careful if you're using an amplage catheter and you're, you're doing a procedure out of some reason, suppose the pressure is dropping in, in, a, in a hurry. If you try to pull the guide back, in fact, the, the tip of the guide is going to get inside and it's going to dissect it further. So please remember, you need to push it down first, rotate it, then it gets disengaged. And then after that, you can remove the guide. So. Uh, extra backup, and these are the last one slide, which I'm covering last two slides that basically normal practice, we use either the XB catheter or EBU catheters, because there is a, there is an excellent coaxial, uh, because they do, they don't have any primary curve as such. They have a, they completely, they take the advantage of the opposite wall of the aorta. That is where the support, the catheter is supported and it goes directly with the coaxial with the artery. And so you get a lot of good support and, uh, uh, you can do the procedure pretty uh, simply, pretty easily. And uh, these are the different catheters. Uh, I can't get into that. When you have a dilated aorta, you usually use a 5 and GL5 in the AL3. Majority of times, cat the labs won't have GL5s and other things insist to keep them. And when you have a, a, a superior takeoff, you can take a different catheters, high takeoff, AL3, low takeoff, AL1 and other things. And right coronaries, again, because many times you have uh, anomalous right coronaries, the cooking the anomalous right coronary becomes a really difficult, uh, challenging task. So you again have, and although the right catheter is right coronary, many times is very well uh, engaged with uh, M plus left catheter, AL, rather than an AR catheter. So there are again different Lima catheter is again one, uh, an important catheter, uh, not only for hooking the Lima, uh, but even sometimes the abnormal uh, origin of RCA can sometimes can be approached to a, a, a Lima catheter. So with that, I would come to an end. Pigtail is again uh, a thing which you, you should know, which is often used in LV and US. You have a marker pigtail because then you can have a, a different sizing of it. Thank you so much. Sir, would you take? Go on. 
Dr. Palayani, sir, would you? Uh, okay. So now, uh, moving on to the next uh, uh, topic, Dr. Palayani, sir, is uh, is going to talk upon on stents and its uh, uses in the cath lab. Over to Dr. Palayani. Sir. sir, you are not audible, sir. Sir, unmute, कर लीजिए. Sir, unmute, yeah. please. You you got my slides? Yes, sir, doing it, sir. Uh, Hugh and Sharma, I think both of you are there, listening to me along with uh, all of our attendees. I have been attending this program. I have been examiner in the examinations and uh, gone all over the country. Unfortunately, what I find that what students want and what is being taught in these in in these uh, teaching courses is something which they don't they don't they don't practice in their practice after they finish their dm or finish their dnb say for example what was being taught like apex apex beat murmurs and today rama talks so beautifully about the oximetry oximetry once these guys get into the practice it's of it's not much of use today because most of the things are done by the investigations and also the type of cases that one sees in the clinical practice they are not the ones which they will be handling 99% of them won't be handling such cases and unfortunately what we are going to be talking is something which they won't be asked in a examination largely it will be they will be practicing after they come out of the examination hall successful so anyway but you need the introduction you need the training for both it is like when you go to the mountains you wear the mountain shoes but when you come back to the city you wear the fancy shoes like hush puppy or clark and so on and so forth so we are going to be talking about the hush puppy and the clark type of shoes today and that is the stents and let me tell you when you learn this when you listen to this you will remember me after you have finished your examination not before that uh, next slide oh i i you you will do it abarba vara slide linson move the slides please okay vara sir make it up yeah uh some of us who have come through the ages of the balloon angioplasty we had the problems and all of us realized that when you do a balloon angioplasty there are chances of abrupt vessel closure in 4 to 8% of the patients they needed an emergency coronary artery bypass graft surgery because if not some of them will die and uh, develop a myocardial infarction the whole purpose of angioplasty will be lost not only that there was an abrupt closure but there was a problem of restenosis about 30 to 50% people develop a restenosis next slide what well, i am not able to yeah and somewhere in 1994 John Turk Turko Rubin two stent came in, which was nothing but a coiled wire like this, mounted on a, a kind of a shaft, which was implanted in a patient who had an abrupt vessel closure, and therefore the patient could be bailed out. And this was made up of 316 L stainless steel. Some of you who know what actually. This 316 L means this is a grade of stainless steel. If you go in the market, try to buy the stainless steel material, you will find that there is different grading, 200, 215. The highest grade is that of 316 L, which does not corrode and which has got a good strength. And therefore, in the stents, the material that that was used in the beginning was 316 L 
stainless steel. Next slide. Then came the Palma Shah stand, which was also a stainless steel stand, which was a balloon expandable. The stand was mounted on a balloon and balloon was inflated along with the stand inflated and was implanted and placed on the intima of the vessel. And it was found that when you deployed the stand, you could take care of the abrupt vessel closure as well as the restenosis rates were markedly reduced with the stents as compared to the balloon angioplasty. Next slide. So when you want to select a stent, at the moment, you don't need to do this because your boss in the cath lab or your head of the department looks at all these features. I don't know even they look at it or not. But basically, one should look at it. That there are key factors that influence the stent selection. Number one, the stent should be deliverable. It should be safe because it should not be responsible for producing a stent thrombosis. It, these, these struts should be wide enough so that you could have an access to the side branch and then the freedom from restenosis. Next slide. So therefore, when you select a stand and look at its performance, you use certain terms. When you talk to the, 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 the guys who come and sell you the stands, they will tell you, they'll talk to you big things and tell you the my stent is deliverable means the term which is used to indicate the overall ease which you which you could push the stent down trackability then good strut support next slide radio opacity you should be able to see the stent where you place the stent so that the accurate placement of the stent can be performed scaffolding it should give you a scaffold so that the patient does not get a recurrence uh, immediately, comfortable, comfortable, com conformability, so that it conforms to the curvature of the vessel, placement accuracy, and minimal balloon overhang. And to me, this seems to be one of the very important factors which many of the people don't look at, is the minimal balloon overhang. Because whatever is the overhang is the balloon. And when you start, inflating the balloon, that particular part of the balloon is not covered by the stent and produces a distal dissection. Next slide. So therefore, if you want to select the stent, there are certain desirable characteristics. It should have a low crossing profile, high flexibility, high stent to host biocompatibility, high radial strength, low metallic surface area, favorable radiographic properties, good trackability, and easy deployment. Next slide. Now, there are two basically two types of stents. Number one is the balloon expandable stents that you have learned if you have seen some of the tower procedures, some of the tower materials are the balloon expandables, like the sapien aortic valves, or there can be self-expanding stents like what you see from the Medtronics where the Evolute R stent, uh, aortic, aortic valve, is uh, mounted on the self-expanding stent. Usually, these are all nitinol stents because nitinol, uh, nitinol material has got a memory which sort of starts to expand to the required diameter of the vessel. Next slide. The material quality should be very, uh, very high quality. It should have, it should be corrosion resistant, biocompatibility, adequate radio opacity, and create minimal artifacts during MRI. As a matter of fact, today all these stents, your patients will come and ask you. Doc, I had some three, four stents. Can I go for the MRI? Uh, be sure that today all the stents that are deployed, they are all MRI compatible. So very safely, you can tell your patients to undergo an MRI uh, if at all he needs some MRI procedure for some brain or abdomen or wherever he needs an MRI. He is 
we are all MRS safe. Next slide. Now, there are some stain materials which are non gradable material, non degradable material. And uh, the earlier ones were 316 is stainless steel. Next slide. Now, today, what we use most of the time, most of the time are the cobalt chromium. They have got a very high radial strength. The radio opacity is very good. So most of the current stents that we use in the second generation DES stents used are all more or less universally <coughs> cobalt chromium stents. Next slide, please. But there are some other materials which have been used and tried. One of them is tantalium. Next slide. Titanium has been used. It is excellent biocompatibility and corrosion resistance. And uh, it has been used for the nitrite oxide coating on the 316L uh, uh, along with it, along with 316L uh, stainless steel. It has been combined with that. So it gives you a good kind of a backup, good visibility, but some of it has not be become popular. Next slide. Knit in all stands, as I said, they are self-expanding and they were very popular at one time because they could be deployed, say you use, use the three millimeter as a uh, knit in all stand, R3 is 3.5, it is a self-expanding stand. It will confirm to 3.5 millimeter. However, they went out of they went into disrepute because there was a very high rate of restenosis. So nitinol stents were withdrawn. At least the coronary stents were withdrawn from the market. Next slide, please. So therefore, looking at the first generation and the second generation stent, today most of the stents, as I said, they are cobalt. Chromium. It is mainly because their strength is very high and very important. Their visibility is very good. So the way the, the accurate placement of the stent is very precisely done. And uh, therefore, the, the choice of the stents use of material used by the companies is cobalt chromium. Next slide, please. There are some metallic materials which are biodegradable. And one of them is pure iron, which oxidized to the ferrous and ferric ions. There are other ones like magnesium alloys. And uh, at present, a magnesium self-absorbing uh, bioabsorbable stains are marketed by the Biotronics, which have not been available in India, but it is undergoing some extensive trial in Europe. So once we know that, Maybe in the place of the Abbott's bioabsorbable stents, this magnesium alloy stents may be more may prove to be better than the first generation that is PLLA uh, self-absorbing stents. Next slide, please. The biodegradable stents went out of market because it has got a severe drawbacks. Next, next slide. And you show me the comparison. Next one. And you, it's a, caused a permanent physical irritation and it led to a endothelial dysfunction. Therefore, the chances of stent thrombosis, restenosis with the BVS <coughs> was same as that of the non-absorbable stent. So therefore, they went out of market the Abbott had to withdraw the product from the market because of the kind of adverse events that were seen after the absorb one and absorb two trials. Next slide, please. So looking at the evolution of some of the stents, we had a wire mesh in the beginning. Now today we have got a modular stents and uh, uh, we, we have got laser. Most of these are all laser cut. Or and uh, they are they they are then uh, coated with the drug as well as the polymer and uh, used into our patients. Next slide, please. 
What about these 10 steps? We talk a lot about this 10 steps. Ultimately, a stent has got a fine material which can consist of different thickness. We call it a strut thickness. The larger the state strut thickness, higher is the chance of restenosis. Several of these several trials have shown in the past. So therefore, today, in the past, more, many of the stents had 125, 150 micron strut thickness. But today, most of the stents have got the maximum strut thickness of 80 or 85 microns. Please don't accept any stent which has got more than 80 or 85 microns thickness because thicker the strut thickness, higher is the chance of restenosis. Next slide, please. So therefore, if you see the strut thickness from the 140 microns, today we have come down to 80 microns. There are some stents in some diameters, like 2.5 millimeter diameters, they have gone down further to about 60 microns also, which perhaps uh, can be, in the long run, can show a lower chance of restenosis. But most of the stents today are some, something like 80 or 81 microns thickness. Next slide. Now, when we talk about one more thing, is the uh, closed cell and the open cell design. Now, this is very important for you people to realize what a closed cell means and what an open cell means. A closed cell means at every junction, it is joined by these links. You can see this is a closed cell design. There's no open cell anywhere. Everywhere they are connected. All They're all connectors here. There are connectors everywhere. Whereas in the open cell design, if not all, at least two or three such areas are free from the connectors. Now, what is the advantage or disadvantage? You see, this is the cipher stain in the beginning, which has got, which is a closed cell design. It is connected, but today's new designs are open cell. The advantage of the open cell design is that 30 to 35 percent patients who undergo angioplasty have got a side branch. So if you need to undergo or uh, undergo a patient has to undergo a side branch angioplasty, side branch protection, balloon, then one needs an access. A connector being here will forbid you or will obstruct your passage of the wire as well as the balloon and the stand. Whereas here the access is little free. Also, we do what we call as a pot proximal optimization in which these areas can become wider and then your balloon and the stand can go through this and you can do the stand of the side branch also very easily. So most of the stands today are all the uh, open cell designs. Some of them are hybrid designs, but invariably all of them are open cell design. Next slide. So therefore, these are the differences between the open and closed cell design. The balance goes down in the favor of the open cell design because it conforms better and the side branch access is better in the open cell design. Next slide. Now, the latest thing that, and the last thing that I want to talk about is the therapeutic agents that are used to coat these stents because ultimately we started with the bare metal stents, but today there is hardly any bare metal stent which is available on the shelf in a cath lab. And the first drug which came in was the serolimus, and then the serolimus, serolimus analogs came. The first one was the cipher serolimus that or rapamycin came in, and then these analogs like zotarolimus, everolimus, biolimus have come in, and the drugs are coated, the stents are coated with any one of these drugs. The most favorable being serolimus, zotarolimus, and the everolimus. These are the three, these two analogs, and the one, the basic drug, serolimus. Most of the stents are covered or the coated with these three drugs. Next slide, please. Next slide is the Paclitaxol. 
and its analogs. There were other drugs which were tried, like tacrolimus, the curcumin, and rivercetrol, and CD34, and then there were stents which are covered with the anti vegf But none of them has become popular. Maybe anti vegf in the future may come, but at the moment, the classical drug eluting stents are the most favored ones in everybody's laboratory. Next slide, please. Now, how does the drug get coated on the stent? There are basically three components. A stent strut in the center. Then there is a matrix, drug-loaded matrix, which consists of the drug and the polymer, because drug directly in most of the stents is not coated on the stent strut. There are some stents, stents which are polymer free because ultimately it has been found that the polymer is inflammatory and many times inflammatory reactions occur because of the poly polymer. And therefore, there are some stents available which are polymer free. But most of the stents have got a polymer and the drug is loaded in that polymer and the drug slowly gets released from this polymer in about 80% in the first four weeks and rest in two weeks. And the, the, the drug works, there are, some, there are some stains in which the drug is coated is only on the abluminal site, that is on the opposite side of the strut, so that the drug goes inside this inside the intima, but does not get washed up from the, the, in, the lumen surface of the stain. Otherwise, if the drug is coated on this side, as well as on this side, part of the drug can get lost from this side. So the efficacy can be less if the drug has got just an abluminal coating on this side. So the 100% drug can be delivered to the intima. Next slide, please. Now, as I was talking about the overhang, the longer the overhang beyond the stain, higher are the chances of age dissection or the distal dissection. So be careful when you select a stain, ensure that your overhang of the balloon is not more than 0.5 millimeter, not more than half a millimeter. The lower the overhang, less are the chances of trauma to the, to the vessel distal to the stain. Next slide, please. Now, there are dedicated bifurcation stains, but some of them, they have not become very popular. I don't use them personally because I'm not very comfortable with today's open cell design stains. I can access from these same stain into the side branch. I can protect the side branch through that same stain. They're not become very popular, very difficult to deliver. The so complication rates can be, can be, can be high. But many companies try to sell you this uh, kind of a, there is a small outlet here through which another balloon can go. And this particular part will take care of the side branch. But they are not very popular. People still try to use the same balloon and do all the techniques like crush technique, decay crush technique, the, uh, the tap technique, everything they do with the same stain and two balloons. Next slide, please. Slide. Next slide. Now, stents are used not only in the coronaries, but you must know our the vascular friends. Uh, they use these uh, graft stents, and they use into the aorta, into the bifurcation, and they seal these aneurysms with the help of the stent. The graft takes care of the, the blood oozing out. The, the stent keeps them op, uh, completely open and uh, they completely opposed to the vessel wall. And uh, you'll be surprised, and I'm sure you must have seen in your own labs, the way some of our vascular specialists do this stent grafts is really masterly. They do the even the ascending aorta, descending aorta, thoracic aorta, they do, the, 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 even the peripheral vessels, they do with this graft stents. Next slide, please. 
and so are our neurovascular specialists. I have done, actually, I started the procedure of carotid standing in the beginning when the vascular, our neurovascular specialists were not available, but now they are there, they are masters, they can go right inside the brain also and put in these stents there and take care of the sort of, a re, of the stenosis of the carotid vessels, take care of the acute strokes by putting in the balloon and the stent after if the patient doesn't respond to the TPA. Next slide, please. And these stents are limited not only to the vessels, but they are limit. They are now widely used even into the valves. As you know, there are two types as we talked in the beginning. The balloon expandable, which is a sapient valve, which has got a coat, which has got a sheet outside, which is nothing but a stent, and a self-expanding stent, which is the evolute or evolute R from the Metronics, where the stent expands. This is a nitinol material, which expands, and the valve is mounted inside the inside the stent. And then this keeps on expanding over the time, take conforms to the size of the valve. Whereas here, you have to expand the stent with the balloon and achieve the size that the patient's valve needs. So these stents are limited not only to the coronary arteries, but their, their the stents use is expanded to many other areas. Actually, in every part of the body, stents are being used. Next slide, please. And finally, my word of caution to all of you, if you want to do angioplasty and you want to do the complicated cases, as, as Dr. Shiv said, uh, Shiv said that the CTO is a different ball game. You should do after gaining a lot of experience. But I would feel that even in the non-complicated cases, one stand you should always have on your shelf. Do not perform an angioplasty without having a covered stand. A covered stand is a stand in which inside there is a PTFE material. And when you use it, when you perform an angioplasty inadvertently or some inexperienced operators or patients who got CTO, you come across a coronary perforation and the only way you can sort of a bail your patient out is of course, first is to do the pericardiosynthesis, get your surgeon, but on the table, you have got to have these covered stents and there are two covered stents which are available in the market. One is the graft master from Abbott. The other one is papyrus from the biotronics. So I think finally, this is what my caution is to you people, that if you decide to do a complicated or even a simple angioplasty, do not undertake a patient unless you see in your lab, you've got a covered stent. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, I, I feel that, you know, it's very nicely you have covered the whole topic of stents. And lastly, you have re-emphasized the same thing, what I was telling at the beginning also, that it is criminal to do an angioplasty without having a covered stent in your shelf. If you don't have covered stents, uh, it's not, uh, it, it, it almost amounts to criminality if you just do an angioplasty program. So thank you so much, sir, and uh, for covering the whole uh, topic uh, in the limited time. And uh, with this, uh, uh, we move on to the, the next phase now. Uh, which is uh, a case presentation by Mumbai uh, 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 students, LTMG college students. And uh, I, at this juncture, I, uh, I'm happy to share that Professor B. Srinivas is a close friend of mine from Bangalore, from Jayadeva. He, he agreed, thank you so much Srinivas, that you know, at a very short notice, you agreed to join on this meeting and uh, you will also be one of the examiners along with uh, uh, Sandeep. And so if for this case, Dr. Sandeep Bansal would be the main examiner and then he is a clinical coordinator. 
and along with that, Dr. B. C. Srinivas and Dr. Rajiv Bajaj is. Uh, uh, I'm happy he, he is also joining us as an observer, and then along with that, I also will be there in the case. So over to Sandeep, and uh, we you can go ahead with the the present case. So uh, are we able? Hello. Uh, can we see the screen now? We can Sandeep. see. Sandeep, one second. Before that, I would invite the the three students. Yeah, uh, I'm. Uh, uh, the names are. Yeah, they are there with me, uh, Srinivas. So uh, uh, we have uh, three uh, students: uh, Mrinmay Deshpande, uh, Nirmal Banker, and uh, Siddhant Yadav. They are the three students, Correct. and. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you'd all agree uh, uh, Corona has taught us uh, different things which we never used to have in the past. And uh, in the last one year, uh, you know, as everybody else who uh, is a DM examiner, uh, I have also been a part of exams where uh, there are virtual cases. And so this is going to be a virtual case today. And I have the pleasure and honor of uh, having with me uh, uh, Professor B. B. C. Srinivas and uh, uh, my friend Dr. Shiv Kumar Rao, and uh, also uh, a very senior cardiologist from Delhi, Dr. Rajiv Bajaj. Uh, so, uh, and the, we will uh, start with the case presentation. As in, uh, we'll give you the clinical history as we always do, and then um, I'd uh, request. Uh, uh, my co-examiners to cross-question the guys on uh, based on the clinical history. Thereafter, uh, uh, we go ahead with the physical examination and then we uh, uh, try to get to the diagnosis based on physical examination and history. And then finally, uh, we go over with the, each of the investigations and how the case was proceeded with. Uh, so... Uh, uh, this is uh, the typical, uh, the, the, this is the case. Uh, this is not a congenital or a valvular case. So this is the third case uh, uh, for the people who joined in. And uh, uh, although it's okay, uh, uh, I, I mean, one can just read it uh, by oneself also, but for the sake of uh, formality, uh, this is a 65 year old woman she was recently widowed and presented to the emergency room for a chest pain that she developed after a car accident where she was involved. And uh, the pain had been persistent for at least 30 minutes, uh, did not decrease by changing position. Uh, it consisted of retrosternal pressure or heaviness radiating to the chest, uh, to the neck, and it is accompanied by dyspnea and palpitations. Is that okay? Can I go to the next slide, please? You can ask the you can ask no. for the diagnosis straight away. Yeah, Bansal. Actually, we should allow them to present and then you know interpret themselves and okay. then the question. That's either way, better. either way, uh, they can. Uh, uh, yes, you have, you have given away the diagnosis in the first slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the diagnosis <laughs> is there in the first slide. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let them interpret it. Let them uh, actually read the slides and then interpret it. I think we'll ask them to go ahead and interpret. The, the slide control is with me. So whenever they want, I can go with the next slide. Sandeep, they too have got an initial history with them. So no problems. They can also go ahead with that okay. up to the examination part. So no, no, I invite no. Dr. Mnunumai no. to, to, to go ahead with the presentation. No, she will have to share the screen right now. Shiv Kumar, I am sharing the screen. Okay, fine, fine. So whenever they say, I can go next. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. No. Uh, the medical history. And... Yeah, this is the medical history and the cardiovascular risk factors. Uh, there was a family history of uh, ischemic cardiovascular disease. She yes. is a current smoker and uh, takes about 10 cigarettes per day. There's history of arterial hypertension, dyslipidemia, anxious depressive syndrome. She doesn't uh, refer any other uh, previous cardiovascular diseases. Okay. Yes. 
Should I go next? No, I think uh, Dr. Munan, you, you should uh, interpret the history before you go ahead. Uh, sir, she is a um, uh, elderly female, a postmenopausal probably, who has presented with uh, acute chest in uh, acute uh, acute uh, chest discomfort since half an hour, uh, after, uh, which goes in favor of a after a after a traumatic experience, which goes in favor of an acute coronary syndrome first. She also has got multiple comorbidities and risk factors for the coronary artery diseases, including her age, then her uh, family history, her uh, history of smoking, dyslipidemia, then hypertension. So all these are risk factors and considering the typ uh, typical angina, which she uh, gave history of, uh, it goes in favor of an acute coronary syndrome. So uh, you think of nothing else as the possible reason for chest pain? The, 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 the history is very emphatic that she had a she had an accident. She had a vehicular accident. Can the heart be involved in a vehicular accident? Sir, if, uh, if we are considering the history of vehicular accident, uh, uh, still I would like to keep coronary syndrome as a uh, some tra traumatic cardiac injury, myopericardial injury as the second diagnosis. What are the possible cardiac injuries? What are the traumas that can uh, happen in a vehicular injury? Cardiac traumas. Uh, I mean, I'm not uh, very much interested in some... Stair wheel can cause a blunt uh, cardiac uh, injury called as homotio cardis. Or uh, it can cause, uh, because of which there can be cardiac confusion. Commotio uh, cardis is something very specific. Uh, the stair wheel can cause, uh, cause a blunt injury to the, uh, to the pericardium, precordum. Then uh, there can be myocardial contusion. There can be traumatic valvular, acute valvular injury. Or uh, there could be uh, uh, traumatic aortic injuries. Yeah. Those are the those are the traumatic injuries which can happen. This this patient, uh, if if I go back, uh, what are the important points in this history that uh, you analyze, Rinmay? Can you suspect a traumatic coronary injury, coronary artery injury? injury? Spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Uh, we that can... is not be spontaneous anyway. It is secondary to something. But the pain did not decrease by changing the position. So uh, maybe traumatic injuries might increase uh, with uh, changing position. See, when we, when we have very learned people, we have uh, the diagnosis. Dr. Narayan sir uh, was there. Uh, uh, he said that you've given away the diagnosis in the very first time. I'm still here. I'm still here. So, <laughs> so, so uh, 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 do do you find this important that this particular lady was recently widowed? Does it give you a clue to a possible diagnosis? Uh, sir, it can uh, precipitate the stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Exactly, exactly. That's a major trauma. The loss of somebody close in the family is a major, major psychological trauma and that's a that's one of the important uh, you know precipitants of a stress induced cardiomyopathy yes. a lot more than a traumatic uh, uh, vehicular injury the, the, these two words actually i added they may not be there in your presentation but i i added these two words recently widowed because that makes it uh, more plausible and uh, this this uh, history says the pain is not decreasing um, by changing position. What what pains decrease or uh, vary with changing position? For the pericardial uh, pericarditis, uh, uh, pericardial associated uh, pain uh, will uh, reduce on changing the position. Right, right, right. That's that's fine. Anybody else, uh, uh, sir, uh, Dr. Narayan sir, Dr. Srinivas. Would you uh, like to cross question or ask anything? Uh, I don't see. No, no, I think 
continue continue question to you which is the classical problem that occurs with blunt trauma to the coronaries yes so i did not hear the question in blunt trauma to the chest what is the coronary involvement which is the commonest oh. which is the vessel which is just below the sternum so the led yes so dissections and occlusions of the led are very well described in this position which is the valve which is most prone to injury in blunt trauma of the chest the aortic valve no take another guess she has got dyspnea and palpitations mitral well dyspnea is not fitting with tricuspid valve but palpitations will fit with any of the four valves very typically it is tricuspid valve tricuspid anterior you see two or three cases in your lifetime it's not very common all three will be tricuspid valve okay um common to half go ahead uh, so uh, this you again seen should i go further yes sir uh, no allergies uh, was referred by the patient uh, she has two sons in good health at present uh, she is menopausal and retired she drinks a glass of wine once in a while she walks for about 3 km 3 times a week so uh, this doesn't help us in any other way, any way either so uh, these are the medications okay go on patient gives history of taking sertraline uh, 50 mg per day and uh, valsartan 160 mg per day uh, in the morning uh, on uh, her vital signs were temperature was 36 degrees celsius the heart rate uh, was 110 uh, beat per minute the blood pressure was 160 by 100 uh, mm of mercury the respiratory rate was, was uh, 18 breaths per minute and her oxygen saturation while breathing uh, ambient air was 98% okay uh, does it tell you anything uh, do you think this uh, blood pressure is uh, what are the possibilities that this uh, blood pressure is uh uh you know do you think uh, this is because of uh, uh, her anxiety associated with the car injury and pain that she's having or it it's it's just that uh, she's a uncontrolled hypertension sir it uh, it is uh, probably related to her uh, accident uh, because she is also having associated tachycardia yeah 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 so usually uh, that is one important thing in that one uh, sees uh, when there is associated uh, hypertension and tachycardia are uh, coexisting so should i go to the next slide sure. but in the background of dyspnea yeah in the background of dyspnea yes so what does dyspnea indicate uh, dr munami oh what does dyspnea indicate what is the mechanism of dyspnea at this stage why do you think the patient is dyspneic uh, sir patient could be having uh, some acute coronary syndrome because of which uh, she might be having dyspnea does all acs cause dyspnea what is the mechanism behind dyspnea no sir uh, all acs do not cause but uh, dyspnea is an angina equivalent and especially in a female uh, old age female we have to consider angina equivalent uh... do you think this is an angina no. equivalent no no she is already infected according yeah. to you yes. could it be a cardiomyopathy like situation some cardiomyopathy you call yes sir no no what does this dys- dyspnea mean to you i want to understand you are understanding basically subjective feeling of uh, no 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 patient is dyspneic yes sir so what does it tell you a diastolic dysfunction diastolic dysfunction 
no hemodynamically i am asking the hemodynamics of uh, dyspnea in this case what what is the hemodynamic equivalent of dyspnea mm. you do a cardiac catheterization yeah measure all the pressures what will be the how many are you most likely to get in a patient with cardiac dyspnea yeah exactly now sir has put the thing in your mouth actually elevated lv and diastolic pressures okay so you should so what will be the wedge pressures or pulmonary capillary venous pressures because you know if you have mitral stenosis also you will get dyspnea where the lv edp is not elevated hmm. so the exact wording should be increase in pulmonary venous venous pressure so pulmonary venous hypertension is what we wanted all of us so what is the level of pulmonary venous pressure in this case in the patient presented to you in the emergency department sir actually your respiratory rate uh, is given to be 18 breaths per second which uh, which appears normal yes that's a point yeah that's a correct point i think despite the dyspnea and the respiratory yeah. rate is this lady is a little older but uh, in slightly younger uh, lady what would be the commonest cause of breathlessness so onset is acute the onset is acute okay so there can be uh, many causes so cardiac causes non cardiac causes and uh, metabolic causes and psychiatric causes डायग्नोसिसनोसिस Sir, uh, from the di- uh, from the history of uh, uh, acute onset of chest pain, uh, uh, chest pain uh, uh, with an associated history of a road tra- road traffic accident in a patient of uh, in a in a in an elderly female with a with history of uh, being recently widowed, we can keep keep uh, differentials as uh, acute coronary syndrome as the first diagnosis, then uh, traumatic cardiac injury as the second uh, diagnosis. then uh, then then sir uh, uh, traumatic aortic uh, injuries uh, as one of the diagnosis then takotsubo's cardiomyopathy as one of the diagnosis and so uh, would you would you with the suppose i told you that the pulse rate was 110 per minute would you be to tell you whether there is an aortic injury or not sir pulses unequal pulses we'll have to check sir yeah yeah that is what i was looking for uh, okay anybody else would like to ask uh, anything dr srinivas uh, or shiv kumar any, any other differential diagnosis apart from these uh, sir there can be some uh, especially considering that uh, she has a trauma we can also consider non cardiac causes of pain like uh, maybe she has developed a rib injury or a rib fracture or uh, or tension okay, let us assume that uh, there are no non cardiac causes can this be can this be a pericardial uh, condition yes a myopericarditis or pericarditis uh, can be there why myopericarditis only pericarditis doesn't cause chest pain it will cause sir so what is your differential uh, why do you think pericarditis is lower on the card in this case uh, sir because uh, the, the her chest pain was uh, not related to the posture posture uh... can you get uh, pericardial injury without getting an impact on the chest in car accidents Uh, in post radiation and everything we can get very no, if you have a car accident your chest does not get hurt okay but you manage to get a traumatic problem in the heart what is that in deceleration sudden deceleration you can get hemopericardium 
mechanism of it is many different mechanisms have been proposed but it is a very well recognized problem in car accidents without injury to the chest right would you consider aortic dissection sir yes we will have to keep the possibility of aortic dissection also mm-hmm. but, but patient in the upper limb lower limb blood pressure uh, pulses and blood pressure we'll have to check and uh, okay <clears throat> okay yeah. shall we go further yeah go ahead go ahead i think so this is a physical examination you can a uh, patient uh, was agitated alert awake and oriented uh, head eyes ears nose and throat examination uh, it was uh, normal a traumatic mucous membranes moist extraocular muscle intact pupil equally round and reactive to light and accommodation bilaterally bilateral tympanic membranes were intact uh, bilateral sclera and ectric and no conjunctival injection uh, the neck examination showed the uh, supple no jugular vein distension no lymphadenopathy and no carotid bruise cardiovascular uh, examination the heart rate was uh, regular uh, there was a proto diastolic gallop with s3 uh, apical holosystolic grade 2 by 6 murmur no rubs uh, no muscular reflux and capillary refill less than 2 seconds so the general physical examination it puts at least one or one condition lower on the cards what is that sir uh, trauma trauma correct she's absolute her her glasgow coma scale uh, would be i mean we haven't seen the movements but looks all right the patient looks all right so the trauma will go go lower down in the cards okay um, go on uh, should i uh, go further or would you like to see this uh, no. no the present the, the scenario the signs does it give any clue So, what's your interpretation of the, you know, protodiastole gallop with S3 and the apical mm-hmm. holosystolic murmur? What, what is the apical holosystolic murmur? Underlying mechanism behind these two findings. So that gallop could be uh, because of the hyperdynamic uh, means uh, circulation, which means because of her tachycardia, she could be having that S3 gallop. In a patient who is complaining of dyspnea. Doctor Rajiv Bajaj asked you, "What is the commonest valve involved?" So tricuspid. Here you are. You have a hollow diastolic murmur. There is a third heart sound. Mitral valve, sir. Mitral valve. Mitral valve. And S three could indicate a early heart 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 failure. It could be a sign of heart failure. S three in MR versus S three in AR. What is the difference? is is s3 of any importance in mr or is it physiological so no it it usually uh, mr is accompanied by s3 yes doctor three occurs in er yes sir if s3 occurs with aortic regurgitation then does it have a different connotation as compared to an s3 with mitral regurgitation you have two patients both of them have a left ventricular third heart sound one of them has ar one of them has mr so is is the are the implications same in both the cases or they are different sir uh, proto diastolic uh... what causes s3 in a patient of mr sir the uh, the the blood which has gone back into the atrium after because of the my, my, the regurgitant volume uh, comes back inside the left ventricle which causes the s3 in mr so there is increase in the diastolic flow across the mitral valve what causes s3 in ar sir the re- regurgitant volume from the aorta comes back inside But S three comes from what? From the AR jet. Yes, sir. What causes S three? I mean, if there is AR, will 
the AR cause the S3 or something which has developed secondary to the AR? That uh, that uh, it, it occurs because of the uh, regurgitant uh, flow which is uh, which is hitting the mitral uh, AML. Uh, that causes S3 or some other. That causes sir uh, Austin Austin Flint uh, murmur. So if there's a true S3, what will be the cause? What causes S3 in all the other patients that you see apart from mitral regurgitation? Commonest cause of S3? Increase LV and diastolic uh, volume. PHF. Yes. Okay, I have another question for you. If this patient has developed tricuspid valve injury, what kind of a murmur do you expect? Sir, uh... Uh, early diastolic, early or early or uh, diastolic, uh, 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 early systolic or pan systolic murmur. Pan systolic or mid systolic? Sir, mid mid systolic murmur. Why mid systolic? Sir, since this is an acute uh, tricuspid valve injury, uh, and uh, we'll get more probably we'll get an mid systolic murmur. So acute is not the correct explanation. Normotensive TRs will not have a pan-systolic murmur. Systolic quality. Mm -hmm. If there's pH with TR, you will get a murmur like MR. If the right-sided pressures are normal, then the right-sided regurgitant murmurs are not like AR and MR. They tend to be short and late. Okay? Hey, should we go ahead, please? Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, Mrinmai. Lungs, uh, no rails on auscultation, no ronchi wheeze, no echony, no alteration in tactile uh, frematus and normal upon percussion. Per abdomen, uh, no pulsatile mass stress, normal bubble sound in all four quadrants, no high-pitched or tinkling sounds, resonant on percussion, soft, non-distended, non-tender, no rebound or guarding, no costovertebral angle uh, tenderness and uh, no hepatosphenomegaly. Uh, there was no cyanosis or clubbing and no peripheral edema. Uh, there is no focal neurological deficit. Uh, psychiatric examination, no, no hallucination. Uh, normal speech and no dysarthria. Uh, skin examination is normal. Okay. Ma, is this contributory in any way? The, the, the general physical examination and... Neurological and psychiatric or skin. So she does not have any also Sorry? problems. And she does not have a means her she does not have rails on auscultation and no ronkar wheeze, so which indicates that she has not yet gone into uh, into pulmonary venous hypothesis. Pulmonary edema has not yet happened. Right. So where do you reach right. your diagnosis now so, on this examination? Sir, uh, then acute coronary syndrome uh, will uh, will again be the first diagnosis, followed by uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy. You're emphasizing so much of stress-induced yeah. cardiomyopathy. Are, are you sure <laughs> you're aware of the diagnosis or you're just may, you, you seriously think about it? No, sir. Uh, first is acute coronary syndrome only, sir. First uh, diagnosis is acute coronary syndrome. So what would you like to do now after this? After this examination, what will be the first thing? Suppose you're suspecting ACS. What do you want to do? ECG will do. And the cardiac uh, troponins. High sensitivity troponins. How much time it takes to... Okay. Deliver so let's... Oh, sorry, Sandeep, go ahead. Yeah. No, no. You, uh, you were asking something. I was just asking whether we should go next. Yeah, no, I'm just asking. She said trop troponin. So, uh, how much time it takes usually the troponin eyes to be uh, uh, markers can be identified? Sir, uh, two to three, uh, two to uh, two to uh, six hours. Sir. So no, uh, tell me one thing. Which is the earliest? Which is the earliest marker? Um, bi biomarker to go rise in case of an acute. Uh, my cardiac injury. 
so that high sensitivity troponin acids and the cpk mb can get uh, can get elevated for no what is the utility of no that's not the correct answer if if i if you get a mcq that the choices are uh, <clears throat> myoglobin cpk troponin or ldh which is the one which rises the earliest so the myoglobin and why is it not clinically used uh, sir it is non specific uh, non specific yeah so you know that it is non specific that's the main reason uh, uh, why we don't use myoglobin as the marker myoglobin may be rising in uh, within about an hour or hour and a half but uh, the thing is uh, you don't use it what is the uh, what is the you, you talked about high sensitivity troponin so what is the utility of high sensitivity troponin and how do you make out Did whether a person has nadia 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 what is the how do you diagnose uh, an acute coronary syndrome or uh, uh, a high risk acs or uh, um, a myocardial infarction based on high sensitivity troponins sir uh, they can be uh, they can be they are uh, the levels are uh, increase very rapidly and uh, are more more uh, likely to be specific for a myocardial injury and uh, more than 99 uh, one level more than nine, uh, level more than the 99 percentile can uh, give us big data what are you uh, what do you know what do you mean by high sensitivity troponin what is the normal measurement the conventional troponin that uh, we use the conventional troponin i that we use what is the unit of measurement in that nanogram nanogram per liter nanogram per liter suppose you can have picogram per liter then what happens so then it it indicates it's elevated then it is then it becomes high sensitivity the 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 difference between the two is that you measure it either in nanogram per liter or nanograms per ml that is the difference in the the troponin is the same so how do you measure how do you know that the patient has had a acute coronary syndrome are you aware of uh, are you aware of 0 0 3 hours or 0 2 hours or 0 1 and 3 hour protocols of high sensitivity troponin that may be a little little um, little difficult for you but you don't uh, you don't diag- there are very few uh, cut off values of high sensitivity troponin which can be used uh, as a single reading to diagnose acute coronary syndrome yes sir you have different protocols that you should be aware of so the, you you have what the european society of cardiology recommends is a 0 to 3 hours protocol means you measure the hscrp hs uh, troponin at 0 hours and then at 3 hours and then you do the uh, uh, make your diagnosis okay um, uh, then uh, uh, anybody else has any questions please we got dragged I into i think she wants an ecg and let's see how okay. much let us see the ecg then does this so this ecg shows a normal sinus rhythm with a heart rate of around uh, 100 beats per minute uh, mm-hmm. patient has a complete right bund block and then sp segment depression with t wave inversions in uh, in, in sorry uh, in the lead v1 to v6 sir. so what are what are secondary t wave changes in case of a right bundle branch block and when do you say the t wave inversion in such a case is is relevant or clinically important or 
suggestive of ischemia do you do you normally also get t wave inversions with rbp yes sir we can get in which leads do you get those t inversions we get v1 to v3 v1 to v3 yes, so why are you getting them in v4 by v6 also in this Uh, sir, it uh, it indicates some myocardial uh, means they are uh, non uh, non ST elevation non NST MI changes. Yeah, basically they suggest ischemia or uh, maybe even a non ST elevation in the patch. That's that's the right explanation. Anybody else would uh, like to ask anything? Yeah, at this stage, what is your diagnosis at this stage? Uh, sir, uh, it is uh, unstable angina versus non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, sir, based on the ECG. What is all, all, yeah, all along you were expecting ST elevation in my till now, but now, yeah, it, it, it actually now, it, yeah, the ECG is not you know suggestive of uh, ST elevation, and then so uh, either it's an unstable angina or a non-ST elevation in my, yeah, right. What is the D winter sign? Uh, sir, in uh, D winter sign, sir, it's 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 a it's a sign of non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction in which uh, there's there are. Uh, uh, non-ST elevation MI. Yes, sir, non-ST segment elevation MI. Uh, it's actually controversial. Some people include it under ST elevation. Some include under non-ST elevation. Uh, it has got a, uh, a down sloping st depression with tall t waves uh, and it is sensitive for uh, proximal lad stenosis and needs urgent revascularization it's an upsloping actually it's not a down sloping at j point okay depression with t wave uh, tall t waves in the yeah. anterior leaves anything else you find Sir, uh, some notches somewhere Yes, sir. In V1, there's a notch. Usually, you should have a negative limbs notch in V3, V4, or V4. Okay. What is the difference between valence and deventer? Ah, uh, sir, uh, they are mainly ECG changes. Uh, ECG differences are there uh, because lesion is mostly proximal LED lesion. Ah, uh, the in valence sign there are two types: valence A and B. In valence A, there are uh, deep uh, T wave inversions in the V2, V3 uh, in the in the anterior chest lead, and in uh, valence type B, there are biphasic T wave inversions in the chest lead. Can you get confused uh, the D winter with uh, posterior wall MI? Uh, sir, yes, sir. We can get confused. We'll have to do the right and uh, posterior leads of the patient. Okay, good, good. Any more questions, or we go next? We'll go ahead. Yeah. So this is the sinus. Uh, the the EKG findings. She just told us that these are her lab tests. Lab test shows that the CBC is normal. The renal function test uh, shows creatinine pointed, which is normal. Her hepatic functions are normal. Electrolytes are normal. Uh, fasting blood sugar is high, slightly high. Uh, troponin I is a point one three nanogram per milliliter, uh, which is uh, elevated. Uh, then CPK MB is uh, normal. Uh, BNP is also normal. Uh, inflammatory markers like ESR, CRP are normal, and D-dimers are normal. So, what does this? Uh, what do you? What are your? What are your negative or positive conclusions from these investigations? <laughs> Uh, sir, uh, it tells us that some myocardial injury has happened to the patient, sir, because the drop I are elevated. Mm -hmm. And what else? Sir, and her uh, BNP levels are normal. So, so there is there is at least no um, that the the cause uh, of acute heart failure. Uh, being, I mean, the acute heart failure being present is less likely, though not impossible, but less likely. And uh, uh, okay, anything else? Do you do you do CKMB these days? No, sir. No. Uh, 
how do you diagnose a reinfarction then in present times how do you diagnose a reinfarction sir in reinfarct mr there's a role of cpk md and suppose you are diagnosing on basis of troponins then your patient is admitted in the hospital you have the troponin that is raised and 3 uh, 4 uh, days later the patient has chest pain again how do you diagnose this uh, whether this is reinfarction or this is not reinfarction sir we have to see the trends of troponin i again uh, if if it is showing an increasing trend uh, then it indicates how much how much increase do they say is diagnostic of a reinfarction uh, sir uh, se se 70 70% percent 25% increase or more when you know a troponin level then any increase which is more than 25% in that is suggestive of reinfarction again the current esc guidelines any more questions uh, gentlemen or the raised tropi levels yeah very valid yes sir what are the other causes for raised tropi levels uh sir heart failure uh then uh, acute uh, tra uh, traumatic injury to the heart or uh, uh myocarditis or uh, Uh, is the tropi relevant in the covid era yes sir myocarditis it can give, give us an index of myocarditis present and also inflammatory marker also it is it can indicate it is an indi inflammatory marker acute kidney injury again will raise your tropi levels you know you can falsely ckd patients you can often oh, okay yes, similarly yes. septicemia patient again will septic shock also tropies will be elevated and you can falsely put into that okay so those are all the things also you need to consider just tropi alone will not be able to guide you okay fine uh, i think we have yeah. we have got 8 minutes so let's get on to the next one yeah srinivas you want to ask something fine uh, go ahead go ahead yeah the chest x ray shows normal heart size and volumes no bone fractures uh, and uh, no signs of trauma or dissection of major mediastinal vessels absence of pulmonary congestion pleural effusion or signs of pneumothorax right we go next so these are the, so these are the possible differential diagnoses that you have already kept okay should we go ahead yes sir at this stage what do you think it is is it uh, myocardial disease or ischemic or is it uh, at this stage so it is a uh, myocardial non st segment elevation myocardial infarction okay so uh, how would you proceed now uh, sir uh, we'll, what do you want we uh, will uh, risk stratification of this patient has to be done now uh means uh, since he has he has he is elderly with a high risk factor and uh, ecg changes and elevated prop uh, enzymes but still he is hemodynamically stable so uh, we will go ahead with the uh, uh, with uh, early invasive uh, early invasive uh, strategy uh, not urgent but within 24 hours uh, we need to do uh, do a coronary diagnostic coronary angiography of this patient so we can do uh, serial ecg monitoring and uh, serial troponin monitoring in the cardiac icu with the ecg with a, with a with a cardi cardioscope attached and uh, we will also perform our 2d echocardiography so echo findings are highlighted here do you find anything wrong in this Uh, the aortic valve is slightly flared, slight enlargement in the left atrium. Mild respiration caused by displacement of the papillary muscle. Normal right atrium. Uh, right ventricle also normal in size and the function. Normal tricuspid valve, mild tricuspid regurgitation. Normal pulmonary valve. The intra atrial septum is intact. Uh, left ventricle is slightly hypertrophic. 
with apical and uh, mid left ventricular dilatation moderate regurgitation of systolic global function for uh, complete akinesis of the uh, apical and mid segment and compensatory basal hyperkinesis the ejection fraction measured by simpson's biplane method was 40% normal pericardium uh, aorta uh, aorta root dimensions and ascending aorta all look normal the inferior vena cava was not dilated pseudo uh, normal diastolic pattern with increased filling pressure also to so the point number 4 the left ventricle is slightly hypertrophic with apical and mid ventricular dilatation what does this point tell you sir it indicates that the patient has has cardiomyopathy stress this goes more in favor of a stress cardiomyopathy any more questions or should i go next do you no, do you conclude it do you conclude at this stage no oh, sir we need to rule it out by performing so you, you cannot conclude is it not so you can suspect but still i think you have to rule out coronary artery syndrome you know ac acs it's a diagnosis of exclusion it's not a diagnosis of you know uh, so uh, these are the loading medications that this patient has been given any comments or any any problems or any comments associated with this these brinbay are you are you happy with the treatment that has been given as is shown here yes sir Yes. Okay. Fine. So, so, what is your? Do you have a single diagnosis now, or more than one diagnosis? No, no. We will have to rule out the. Uh, uh, the uh, we need to understand. We need to undergo coronary angiography first. So, coronary artery disease is one. Is there any other which is still uh, on the cards? Sir, uh, the stress cardiomyopathy is the diagnosis because can be the diagnosis because uh, her echocardiography shows. Uh, a basal hyperkinesia with apical balloon so if that is still all uh, diagnosis what would be your treatment would this treatment be good for it or would you like to address the treatment kya hua theek hai jo sir bolenge wo karo sir bolenge wo karo Since you have both diagnoses, would you like to modify the? This is what you would give for a ACS. Yes, sir. Since you have a differential, also, would you like to modify it? Okay, doesn't matter. What was it on the ECG that is fitting? Which one is the ECG fitting with? Your electrocardiogram is favoring which of the two diagnoses? ट्रीटमेंट The coronary angiography and uh, left ventricular ventriculography was performed uh, within 24 hours from admission. Showed right coronary artery dominance and absence of significant coronary artery stenosis. The left ventriculography showed complete apical and uh, mid ventricular akinesis with systolic apical balloon and moderate systolic dysfunction. Uh, no spasm was recorded. So can you just uh identify the artery for me please uh, so the on the left left side of the screen there is the uh, the the left system of the heart uh the 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 one towards us is the left uh, circumflex coronary artery and uh, the the one which is going above is the uh, is the led uh, so actually i don't have a pointer okay uh
what is this sir this is the lcx this artery is the lcx think think and what is this sir uh, the the om obtuse marginal one om one this one is the om or this one is the om Sorry, this one is the om one and that one is the lcx right okay me go ahead so what does this show you what is this uh, that has been done so this is the ventriculogram which has been performed using that pictel catheter hmm uh shoots are taken during systole and diastole hmm. uh, which shows that uh, there is apical uh, ballooning present with basal uh, basal contraction right right so uh, this clinches your diagnosis of what sir uh, the stress induced cardiomyopathy stress induced cardiomyopathy what is the typical ecg so, pattern in stress induced cardiomyopathy ah uh, sir uh, during the evolution phase there will be the prolonged qtc and the deep t wave inversions the most common typical pattern is what uh sir it includes no st segment uh, changes or it could even include the st segment elevations there can be any uh, pattern which is consistent with the diagnosis of acute coronary stress syndrome uh, which can present in tacos tubo cardiomyopathy yes yeah, so the best answer is that uh, in tacos tubo the ecg resembles a Acute ST elevation MI in the anterior veins. Anterior veins. Like many of these patients go for primary and you find no coronary disease. That's how you begin to suspect it. Yeah. Is there any difference in the ECG pattern of anterior MI versus the stress-induced uh, the cardiomyopathy uh, uh, ST elevations in anterior cardiac? Is there any difference? Sir. the the in st elevation it will be mainly territory defined uh, and the territory de defined uh, will be the definition will be there whereas in uh, tacos tubo maybe all the leads will show ecg changes uh, then evolution of the ecg goes different in st elevation mi and tacos tubo cardiomyopathy okay thanks i think it's yes, i think uh, um, Uh, Shiv Kumar, uh, we are done with. I think uh, the time is also up. Yeah, yeah. Thank so, you, thank you, Sandeep, and uh, thank you, Dr. Manmohan. And you have really presented well, and yeah. you defended yourself good. And uh, your uh, probably the discussion of the case was good. Um, whether the diagnosis is non known or non is irrelevant, but uh, you could uh, you know stand and congratulations. You did a. No, you presented nicely thanks sandeep and thanks dr srinivas thanks dr thank you thank you thanks all of you for joining and then with this we move on to the next session uh, where uh, i request and invite dr satyavan sharma sir for the approach to x rays uh, and um, here the basically again because X ray is is a, such a situation where uh, we need an interaction so that people can do. So there are uh, boy, there are students from uh, uh, different colleges, and uh, the I think from SSKM there is a Kaushik, Dr. Kaushik, Dr. Bimal, Vidyut Roy, Kamlesh, Rakesh Das, Saiket Prasad, and Somya Deep. is from S, uh, from sskm and from nrs hospital dr adil dr priyank jain dr amit chaturvedi sir sir we have sir for this session we have sct and batra sir okay you sent me both i have no idea at all so uh, sorry for that confusion and for this session we have dr sundaram and saikiran from sct and from batra dr himanshu ishan shailender swati and bilai ahmed yani okay so over to dr satyavan sharma sir can you see my slides not it sir 
now yes, yes sir. sir actually i was uh, not aware that uh, the format of this will be interaction with the student so i had actually prepared in a different way never mind since uh, there will be so many uh, since there are so many students uh, who are there i'll change the format and maybe you know i will be able to cover just a small percentage of uh, what i intended to do so what what i do is i'll initially just give it three four minutes of background and then we'll start uh, with asking questions and we'll take that way no issue uh, the chest X-ray is an extremely important investigation in diagnosis of heart disease. It is widely available, it is economical, and it's a very useful imaging. It provides both types of information, and it's extremely important to know that it provides physiological information, and in many conditions, you can give provide a useful hemodynamic information from looking at the x-ray mm -hmm. and also can give uh, and also provides anatomical information serial chest x-rays as we know in our day-to-day -day practice are extremely important in management of the patient it is very important for all of us to understand that there are some technical factors and we should be extremely aware of them one is whether this x-ray has been properly taken whether there is any rotation, how is the exposure, it is taken in inspiration, whether it is taken in erect position and it is a PA view or some other thing. Whenever you are looking at an x-ray, it is extremely important that an individual during examination and also in day to day develops an algorithm for interpretation of the x-ray which should include the assessment of the sin, uh, situs, should look at the cardiac cellet. And in the cardiac cellet, you should try and know the cardiothoracic ratio. It gives us an idea about cardiomegaly, also idea on the contour and the shape of the heart, cardiac chambers. And here I'd like to comment the diagnosis of atrial enlargement the enlargement of the left atrium, right atrium, and the great vessels can be made quite well by the chest X-ray. And then the information which provides us a lot of hemodynamic information is to look at the pulmonary venous and arterial hypertension and in shunt lesions to look at the pulmonary blood flow. And also there are many other informations which we can derive from an X-ray looking at the pleura, looking at the pericardium, looking at the calcification, at the valves, devices, coils, wires, etc, etc. Now this is just a normal x-ray and this is to give uh, all of you an introduction. We should look at that the x-ray has been uh, properly taken and these are the structures which we see in a normal x-ray. You should look at the spinous process, you should look at the trachea, and in the normal x-ray, the right border of the heart is made by the right atrium. The left border is by the left ventricle. And then we know about the right and the left diaphragm and both costophrenic angle and the costocardiac angle. The carina, should, we should know about the carina and about the right and the left hilum. Because changes from the normal, the deviation, will tell us about the disorders now can any one of you tell what is the abnormality in this particular x-ray of course the diagnosis is written but i will like uh, anybody to come forward and tell me particularly i will like the person who is speaking to comment on which cardiac chambers he thinks are enlarged in this particular x -ray. Anyone from the... Sir, uh, <coughs> this x-ray, 
the right atrium is enlarged out of, out of proportion of the uh, other leg chambers. What, why, why do you think the right atrium is enlarged? Will you, will you tell me what are the radiological signs of right atrial enlargement? Uh, so the right uh, heart border is like convex. It is, it is protruding out of the uh, right para like vertebral like line, and the distance around the midline is more than five centimeters. Any other point? And it is nearly covering one third of the uh, right hemithorax. Right hemithorax. The right lung field around one third of it is being uh, covered by the right atrial shadow. Okay. Any other point? Angle of carina, sir. See, these are the various uh, radiological signs of increase of the right atrium. Uh, the right atrial contour usually blends with the SVC, right pulmonary artery and RV. And in normals, you will not see a right atrial enlargement. And whenever there is an enlargement of the right heart, the right atrium and the right ventricle both enlarge. Whenever there is a right ventricular enlargement, it usually prevents the delineation of right atrium. But the example which I showed, the right atrial enlargement was very obvious. And the most reliable sign of right atrial enlargement is increase in its height, which was quite obvious in this particular X-ray. The other signs which are known for increase in the, for diagnosing the right atrial enlargement are right cardiac border more than three centimeters beyond right lateral vertebral border or more than 4.5 from the anatomical midline. So these are the, this you should know. Now, can anyone tell me what are the signs of left atrial enlargement? And then I go to show some examples. What are the radiological signs of left atrial enlargement? Widen the carina. Yes. Uh, double the in a disease process, how does left atrium starts enlarging? Which direction it enlarges first? Appendage starts enlarging first. So the carinal angle becomes obtuse. Then appears shadow within shadow. So these first, two are uh, the two of left atrial enlargement. First, it starts, so first it First, it starts in the posterior direction, and uh, when it reaches, then it starts laterally. Then it involves the mediastinum laterally. And which direction left atrium doesn't enlarge? Uh, posterior to extend, when it reaches the, um, uh, when it uh, no more can expand uh, posterior, then it goes laterally, uh, sideways in the mediastinum. Okay. And what will be the best way to know the left atrial enlargement? Uh, uh, the lateral view it will show the uh, uh, it will be close to the uh, spine it will pass the spine actually okay say so, let me tell you the left atrium is normally a midline structure in the posterior location the earliest enlargement of the left atrium is in the superior direction and that causes the lifting of the left vein bronchus it is very important for all of us in cardiology to know the anatomy of the left atrium extremely well because the topographical anatomy of the left atrium helps quite a lot in doing transeptal punctures which are extremely important for all structural heart disease widening of carinan angle is next to follow and further increase of the left atrium can occur in all directions except anteriorly Usually enlargement is posterior with indentation and displacement of the esophagus. That's why, you know, the barium solo used to be used very frequently before for uh, diagnosing the enlargement of the left atrium. Double density, massive left atrium can form even the right cardiac border, but it will never touch the right diaphragm. And as you all should know, Enlarged left atrium can compress the left or the right bronchus, can cause co collapse, and can also cause compression of the bronchus. 
Now, can anybody read this particular X-ray? Anybody wants to comment on this X-ray? Uh, it is an enlarged uh, main pulmonary artery, prominent main pulmonary artery, and the cranial angle is abduced. LA is enlarged. Actually, mild this, cardiomegaly. This, this is an X-ray which has been shown only for telling you that how the enlargement of the left atrium can look like. There is a, a cranial angle is widened. You can see a double cardiac shadow and this prominence which was looking to you like a main pulmonary artery actually is the prominence of the left atrial appendage. Can anybody read this X-ray? This also is largely for showing the enlargement of the left atrium. Anyone? This is again a patient where there is a marked enlargement of the left atrium, double cardiac shadow. And also this patient is having an enlargement of the pulmonary artery. So this was a patient of severe mitral regurgitation with pulmonary hypertension, where you can see both left atrial enlargement and also the enlargement of the pulmonary artery. Now, the cardiac chamber enlargement is another thing which we should know in the chest x-rays is, and I think I will go to the examples and then ask you. Anybody? wants to comment on this x-ray nobody is coming through Hello. X-ray is not visible, sir. No, I I did show the X-ray, but since nobody was speaking, so now it is visible. Ah uh, yes, sir. There's a cardiomegaly with prominent left, uh, prominent ascending aorta, the prominence of the aorta, and uh, look like LV type of apex. Okay. How Some amount of mediastinal widening? Okay. Now look and at there are some right atrial enlargement. Now look at this X ray. What do you think? Here it is a uh, cardiomegaly. Uh, there's right atrial, right atrial enlargement. Uh, between these two X rays, which X ray you think shows that there is a left ventricular enlargement, and which X ray shows that there is a right ventricular enlargement? This particular X ray. Mm. Here, there is uh, obvious right atrial enlargement. It's convex uh, right atrium towards the right side with uh, increase in diametrical midline. Only about the ventricular enlargement. These two X-rays are only for the ventricular enlargements. Here, it could be right ventricular enlargement because accompanied right atrial enlargement is there. So one one important thing to no, is that diagnosis of the left ventricular enlargement and the right ventricular enlargement from the PA view of the chest x-ray may be quite difficult, although there are various shapes and various things given. So if you have to comment on the left ventricular or right ventricular hypertrophy in chest x-ray, then PA view alone is not sufficient. You have to have a LAO or lateral view to diagnose a right ventricular to diagnose a left ventricular hypertrophy or a RAO view to diagnose the right ventricular hypertrophy. Of course, this particular X-ray is the one where the apex is formed by the right ventricle. And of course, uh, one of you told that there is a right atrial enlargement which supports the additional diagnosis. So this was a patient of severe PS where there was an enlargement of 
the right ventricle and the right atrium. I think I'll just go and show one or two more x-rays and then possibly our time will be. Anybody wants to comment on this x-ray? Aneurysmal right atrium. There is mediastinal widening. Okay, so there is a mediastinal white mediastinal mediastinal widening. What else is happening? The and diagnosis is already written up there. Yeah, but uh, it's good they did not see the diagnosis, so <laughs> there can be a better discussion. Say, whenever you see that there is an enlargement of the mediastinum and below the SVC, you are seeing that there is a markedly prominent vascular structure. This is actually the site where you will have ascending aorta. The right atrial enlargement, right atrium usually doesn't come up like this. So this is the patient where there is an aneurysm of the ascending aorta. And just see this one. This is an X-ray, which is also for showing abnormality of the arch. Anybody, where is this very simple. Aortic knuckle is prominent on the right side. Okay. And this is uh, right arch. Right aortic arch. Right aortic arch. Very good. Your answer is correct. What? But what are the? What is the reasons? You have to give us two reasons to say that it is right side aortic arch. It no, is crossing the right bronchus. It is crossing the right bronchus. Anything and about the trachea? trachea Indentation over the trachea right. is on trachea. the right. Side. Right sided indentation on the trachea, sir. So that you should say. So both both the points are important. The indentation and that's crossing the right bronchus. And this one, this is also for telling the abnormality of the ascending or uh, ascending. This is a congenital. Whenever you have isolated levodextrocardia, what is the what is the first possibility that comes to your mind with that kind of arch? Okay, let me give a hint. You have heard of what is called as a D-posed, L-posed. Dr. Narayan has given you actually all that diagnosis and all the hints and additional is coming from l post aorta sir l post aorta why do you say it is l post aorta so because the ascending aorta can be seen on the like left side it will be on the like right side the any comment aorta. any comment on the heart is it um, dextrocardia levocardia mesocardia uh, so the fx is towards the right our apex appears to, uh, to be towards the right. So, dextrocardia with uh, L post aorta. Dextrocardia or mesocardia? Okay, I'll just show one more x ray and then maybe I think. Uh, say, increased pulmonary blood flow or pulmonary plethora is uh, one of the very important uh, chest x ray, this thing. And these are the various. Uh, uh, radiological science of uh, plethora you will see the enlargement of the blood, pulmonary blood vessels due to increased flow and it will depend on the flow pressure or pvr plethora occurs in high output states as you all know and if the shunt is very large you can have even pulmonary veins which can be prominent these are other signs of the plethora and i'll show you x-ray and then i will yeah Anybody wants to read? Cardiomegaly, with in, there is an increased pulmonary blood flow uh, with pulmonary venous hypertension. Can you tell all the signs? 
you describe it in a, in a systematic chest, way chest x ray pa, PA view this cardiomegaly with enlargement of the left ventricle uh, with uh, with pulmonary artery enlargement with mpa enlargement and right pulmonary artery is also in, in prominent and uh, there is prominence of pulmonary veins in the mid zone and lower zone of the left and right lung uh, so pulmonary venous hypertension is there a Would you like that? to mention about the stomach bubble uh, it's on the left side. The stomach bubble is on the left it's side. It is very modern. <coughs> Cytus solitus, levocardia. It was x-ray of the levocardia. It is cytos solitus and levocardia. Yeah, there, there no, was a... That's a very common mistake students make that they often confuse increased pulmonary blood flow with pulmonary venous hypertension. Pulmonary venous hypertension you will get with left ventricular failures, valvular or myopathic. This is increased pulmonary blood flow. You can see end on vessels. You can see the vessels right up to the third part. So don't confuse increased pulmonary blood flow with them. It already says VSDPH over here. You look at the... This is know. actually an X-ray of a patient where there was a left to right shunt, which was almost uh, three to one. You can the see the classical end-on vessels in the, in the middle zone of the lung field. And you can trace the vessels right up to the third part of the lung field. So don't say this is pulmonary venous hypertension. Of course, pulmonary veins can become prominent when there is increased pulmonary blood flow, but this is not left ventricular failure or left atrial failure. This is increased pulmonary blood flow clearly. And as you pointed out, it is a left ventricle situation, so it's likely to be a ventricular septal defect. You don't see the aorta, so it's not likely to be a PDA. I think I'll stop here only because though I had a lot of material, but I think positive time and should not make... Uh... Shall I stop here? Can have another four five minutes if you have one two x rays. Okay. You can show no, it. No, no, I have multiple. I could have done the whole session on only one x ray. <laughs> show two more x rays, sir. Okay, okay. so okay. I'll let me show one with a different. Anybody wants to see this x ray? Very classical. I mean, you should not miss this x ray ever. And there is a hint which is on the top. Yeah. Cyanotic heart disease. There's a storm there. Yeah. Somebody is standing in the midst of a storm, withering it. No man sign. So now describe the radiological features and then give your diagnosis. Or give the diagnosis and justify it. We can see the prominent SBC here. Mm -hmm. Pulmonary blood flow is increased. So it's a sign of heart disease with the increased pulmonary blood flow. No, no. You describe radiological signs in details. You know, you are just trying to. Only one thing which you have told that the SBC is prominent. There are many things which are prominent. Please describe them. This will be an x-ray, you know, which is shown. You think there is increased pulmonary blood flow? Yes, sir. The pulmonary blood flow is increased. Okay. What are the signs of increased pulmonary blood flow in this x-ray? Prominent endon vessels are seen up to the periphery. Okay. It is larger in size compared to the accompanying bronchus. So this is a typical x-ray of a supracardic variety of uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous uh, connection. And you can see there is a... an upturned apex, right ventricle is enlarged. Okay, and I think just one of, just see this one and then I'll stop. Anybody? Okay.
Okay, yeah, let me tell. Uh, any anybody wants to come forward and describe the findings? Cystic cirrhosis behave with prominent main pulmonary artery and right pulmonary artery. Okay. Good. Anything further? Aneurysmally dilated pulmonary artery. Okay. Now, you think this will be an increased pulmonary blood flow situation or reduced pulmonary blood flow situation? Reduced pulmonary blood flow. Lungs up here, oligomia. Oligomia. So, means this patient has got a pulmonic stenosis. Uh, probably it's idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension with the enlarged pulmonary arteries. Mm -hmm. This was not idiopathic dilatation, you know. No, he says idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. Pulmonary yes. artery hypertension. Okay. He says and idiopathic variety. So you are telling IP, any. IPH type. Yes. Okay. Can it be Eisenmenger? Why not? It can be Eisenmenger. It, this is actually a x-ray of a patient who was 50 years old, was known to be having a congenital heart disease since the age of 10 years when the patient refused surgery. And if you look at the x-ray, there is massive dilatation of the main pulmonary artery, right <laughs> pulmonary artery. The aortic knuckle is not prominent. So this was an atrial septal defect. You can see a lot of endone shadows. And if you see the right pulmonary artery, there is a, so much cutoff after the prominence of the right pulmonary artery. So this was a patient we, who had severe pulmonary hypertension with increased pulmonary vascular resistance. So you can see it, it is an Eisenmenger chest X. I think Shiva, uh, I will stop here. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the excellent x-rays. And uh, I would suggest that uh, Vara, you make sure that these, these uh, x-rays are available to the students and they can go through <coughs> their exams. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Narayan, sir, for uh, giving the useful tips. And now we move on to the, the last session of the, the meeting, and that is the spotters. And uh, my colleague and close friend, Dr. Arun Kochar, is also joining from Mohali office, along with Dr. Palajani, sir. So over to Dr. Palajani, sir. Alajani, sir? Yeah. Sir, you're on, you're on, sir. Okay. Circus like, yeah. No, it's seen. All right. I'll share my screen. Yes, sir. Okay, share screen. Got it? No, sir, not yet. You need to share it, sir. I shared it. No, sir. Screen share, you'll have to, again, same thing, exit out from the current, uh, this thing. Uh, minimize it, sir. You minimize and then uh, switch on your, go to the. What are you have with you? Search slides? No, sir, not, no, no. This is not there, sir. Somebody, I don't see on my this damn thing. Okay, I'll share screen again. All right, minimize. So you have to first minimize, other, exit out the full screen, sir. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine. Let me see. Sir. Yeah, first, I uh, share the screen or first I minimize? Minimize. First minimize, sir. Minimize. First open your slides and minimize. Minimize, okay. Got it? Not it, sir. Not it. Sir, first you minimize the zoom, sir. 
and go to the desktop and open up your presentation and okay. then again come back to zoom and uh, make it full screen you will find the uh, in the bottom the share screen sir. okay i don't know some i can't is the but first you will have to close this screen sir the present screen on which you are there because you are on zoom now so you first minimize or come out of it sir and then uh, obviously okay, I'll, i'll come out of it yeah. yes sir yes sir yeah this is the this is my slides ah uh, but it is uh, anti unless you come out of it it's more common and do go to the other side open up your slides and uh, don't make it slide more now sir and then go back to the zoom and then make it full screen you will find below share screen sir then you click on it then you will see your presentation you just click on it it will get open okay i go on the zoom but so that i can't today i can't do it okay can you just mail me down no it will not be easy to mail immediately ah, okay. one minute one minute one minute I'll go to Zoom, okay? Minimize, sir. You will automatically your picture will go away once you minimize it. Sir, can I intervene? Yeah, go ahead, Prashant. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, a small window in your right side. You will find a small. One word, my first. Let me go to the Zoom now. Yes, sir. Because you need to exit that minimize view, sir. See, I'm on right. the I'm on the window. I, I'm on the Zoom now. Okay, right side, uh, bottom green button. You will find a share screen button, sir. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. just click on that button. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and now share. Uh, click on your PPT which you have opened, sir. Oh, I have not opened. Uh, okay, no, not an issue, sir. Sir, if, if you can left hand side top button, desktop button. Just click on the desktop button. Once you once you click on the share screen button, sir, it pop up window will appear. No, no, Prashant, I think sir has not come out of the Zoom yet. Yeah, yeah. Sir, simplest thing will be, sir, you first log out, yeah, you log open out. your presentation, yeah. then yeah, minimize but... it, and then you come to Zoom. Yes, sir. that is the correct thing. I think absolutely right. Doctor Arun, is he there? Doctor Arun Kocher. Yes, sir, he is there. Uh, did he bring any any of his? If he has any spotters with him, we can sh start showing it that. but are you be on the line with sir in the meantime i'll request dr satyavansh sir to continue few more exercises so that you know uh, we don't uh, hang on here sir has come back i think sir has come, come back yeah sir you are mute sir, sir mute yeah sir, you are on mute dr palajani sir you are on mute yeah yeah, yeah. i minimize this sir, hello Ah, sir, you need share, to share. first. I have to share screen, right? First, you open up your 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 uh, presentation, sir. You open your windows or presentation window, and then you do a share screen. It will automatically come there. Okay, all right. Okay. Sir, rights. उस प्रेस करके एग्जिट फुल स्क्रीन कर लीजिए फर्स्ट यू एग्जिट द फुल स्क्रीन सर प्रॉब्लम यू आर स्टिल ऑन ओके गॉट इट नो सर Okay. 
Mara, can I send it to you in two minutes? Yeah, please send it as a mail, sir. That is the best I thing. Send it by mail. Okay. Otherwise, WhatsApp I'll... also. If you have presentation on WhatsApp, you can do it that also, sir. Satyavan sir, you want to show any x-rays? Sir, you want to show some x-rays? Sir, you are on mute, sir. Okay. Is uh, am I uh, X rays are seen? Yes, sir. Okay. Can does anybody wants to take this X-ray? Anybody so the X-ray showing the situs auditus with with levocardia, with uh, egg-shaped heart with decreased pulmonary blood flow. Okay. What what are the signs of decreased pulmonary blood flow in this X-ray? Your diagnosis is absolutely correct. In fact, it is written also there, complete TGA, VSD with PS. Tell me what are the signs of reduced pulmonary blood flow in the X-ray? Uh, so the lung shadows are, are, are completely black. There is no uh, visible vascular like, marking in the uh, lung fields. So what do you mean by black means? Uh, means it is uh, completely radiolucent. No. So why the, why it has become radio lucent? What, what thing is happening? What is the uh, physiological or hemodynamic or pressure change or flow change happening? And what you are not seeing, which has made this X-ray look black? So the bronchovascular like markings are absent mm -hmm. in the X-ray. Okay. So that decreases that there's a severe restriction in the pulmonary blood flow. So okay. And you are not seeing main pulmonary artery segment, which of course, because of the transposition is... Uh, yes, it will be not visible. Not visible. You are not seeing any right pulmonary artery, any left pulmonary artery, any hilar vessels. So you are not seeing any pulmonary vessels, either at the hilum or at the peripheries or in the central. Yes, so sir. that is the evidence of pulmonary oligemia. Now... I will show you one or two x-rays, one x-ray of a patient where there is a pulmonary arterial hypertension. And pulmonary arterial hypertension, there are various causes and uh, the radiological features of pulmonary arterial hypertension are, I did show you then ASD Eisenmenger, dilatation of main right and left pulmonary artery, and there will be constriction of the lobar vessels. And there can be pruning of the pulmonary artery, the peripheral artery segments. And sometimes there can be calcification of the pulmonary artery. Anybody wants to read this x-ray? So just pitching in Dr. Palajani's uh, uh, presentation is ready, sir. Okay, so I'll stop it. You can complete this one, sir, please. Yeah. Okay. Anybody wants to read? So it is situs auditus with uh, levo like cardia. Uh, with uh, normal cardiothoracic ratio, decreased pulmonary blood flow. And uh, what is the striking feature in this X ray? The cardiac size is normal, but what is striking features are there? So it's a very narrow cardiac silhouette with uh, dilated MPA. 
So the pulmonary artery segment is very prominent. Yes. And if you see, look at the right pulmonary artery. You know, that is the sign of that this patient, the right pulmonary artery is prominent, but you don't see any peripheral vessels. So yes, the sir. pulmonary vascular resistance in the patient should be extremely high. Okay, I'll stop here because Sarah has got his... Uh... Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Palayani, sir, sir, you can take over, sir. Sir, you're mute. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, it's seen. Okay. First slide, Tiha. Show me the first slide. Uh, who are the students with us? Okay, sir. Again, I'll name the uh, boys for that. And uh, this is again from SSKM and NRS hey, Hospital. Don't, don't go are... move forward. Be stay there. Yeah. They are from so, Calcutta? Yeah, one batch is from Calcutta and another is uh, NRS oh. Hospital. Same Calcutta, I think. That is also. Okay. All right, is it also from Calcutta? Both. Okay, they are with me. Uh, are you people with me? Kaushik, Bimal, Bidyut, Kamlesh, Rakesh, Saiket, and all these guys. But uh, just say hello, students. There is no response. Uh, sir, I, I am from Sri Chitra, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Uh, I am from Sri Chitra. Okay. Hospital, sir. All right. So you're with me, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Dr. Sundaram and Sai Kiran, I think. All right. Yeah. This now, is this is the angiogram of a patient who came to us with angina. And uh, left coronary angiography has been done. The first is the on the left side is the left anterior oblique view. And the right one is the right anterior oblique view. What is your immediate response when you see an angiogram like this? Here the uh, left image shows the left main is uh, normal. Yeah. No disease. And the LAD and the LCX are diffusely diseased, uh, diffusely small vessels. And uh, LCX, uh, I mean, it is a diffuse disease is there sir, in both the vessels from the bifurcation of LMCA. Uh, any other option you can think of? So the LCX is not seen at uh, all. It, it looks totally occluded. The ramus can, can be seen. Ramus is a very thin vessel. And the LED is also like thin though. It, it, it is like diffusely more diseased. Uh, where is the LCX? You can see LCX here? No, LCX is actually no, not seen. This is a uh, caudal views. This is the quadrant view here. So the LCS yeah. is not seen only. The vessel seen is uh, LAD. How about I say that this is not an LCX. And what you're seeing, this is the diagonal branch of the LAD. Yes, sir. It can be the B1 or, or the like Ramas. So you can see the entire thing here is blank here. Yes, sir. Correct? When you see something entirely this area to be blank. What is the other option that you can think of? So the LCX uh, originating from the right side. Correct. You see, because you don't see anything here, you don't see a stump. This looks more like a septal perforator. If you see a lot of branches coming up like a septal perforator. So this could be, this is not a left circumflex artery. This, this is more like a septal perforator and this is like a diagonal and diagonal many times because the circumflex is coming out anomalously. You can see a diagonal appearing as though it is a circumflex, but it is not giving any branches to the left atrium. So there's no left atrial circumflex branch. So can I have the next slide, please? So one has to explore the right sinus because the commonest area of origin of the anomalous circumflex is from the right sinus. And this is what you see here. This is a right 
This is actually a multi-purpose catheter. Put it into the right sinus. And you can see here the right sinus. Say you can see the circumflex is originating. And it has got a tight lesion here. And uh, these are the OM branches of the circumflex. So when you see an empty area like this, you should always think not of a total occlusion of the circumflex, but you should think of the anomalous origin of the circumflex artery. Next slide. These are the different views. You can see a tight lesion in the circumflex here. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, this is the ECG of a three years old child who is born with sinusis since birth. Uh, I'm sure you people are not very well versed with the vector cardiogram. And this was how we used to do when we were doing our sort of studies. And uh, But just look at the ECG. What do you think? What will you think will be the diagnosis? Probable tricuspid atresia because of the left axis deviation which we see in the ECG and with the history of sinusis since birth. Okay. What are the other signs of tricuspid atresia that you see in this? Uh, uh, absent uh, RV for, like, for forces on V1, V2 and okay. the VR. Any other sign? There is no R wave in V1, V2. You are looking only at R wave. Isn't there a PQRST also? Right atrial enlargement. Isn't the, isn't yes. in the electrocardiogram PQRST? Yes, sir. There is right atrial enlargement, sir. Is it a right atrial enlargement? Uh, what it does P wave look like here? Mitral, sir. Actually, P wave is is a bifid. P. You can yes, see here. Uh, it has got upstroke. Then there's a downstroke. Then again, a slight upstroke. It's very classical of a try. You can see here, especially here, you can see like a bifid P wave, which is like a P mitral A, you can say. This looks more like, a, a, you know, biatrial enlargement. And uh, this is a very classical of tricuspid atresia, where you see a left axis deviation, and then you see the left ventricular forces. And of course, if you look at the vector cardiogram, you can see there's a counterclockwise loop in the left superior left superior quadrant. And you can see it in the horizontal plane. Uh, sorry, this is the front, frontal plane. You can see the counterclockwise loop in the horizontal plane. All the forces are going posteriorly, which would indi indicate the left ventricular hypertrophy. Next slide. Next. Hello. Uh, this is another case uh, where you see a two years old child has got a sinosis since birth. Now, what is your view on this particular ECG? Similar, you can see here, left axis deviation, left ventricular hypertrophy for a two years old child. What will be your diagnosis? Could it be again a tricuspid atresia? Can you people hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, but there is no atrial uh, enlargement as such. Yeah, you um, can see a P wave which is quite peaked. Uh, yes, sir. It's quite peaked. Yes, sir, indeed. Two. And uh, then the other condition which can cause this kind of a left ventricular hypertrophy in a two years old child with cyanosis could be tricuspid pulmonary atresia with the intact septum. ventricular septum. Next slide. 
can we go to the next slide <laughs> what is your diagnosis on this issue Uh, there are no visible p waves so it's a junctional like rhythm with peak p waves so this is you think a junctional rhythm will you look at the ecg a little bit more carefully prominent hyper no. p waves sir hyperkalemia can hyperkalemia yeah actually you can see here the t waves are even taller than the r waves see here T waves are taller than R wave peaked. Tall R T waves taller than even R wave, and no P waves. When you see in a hyperkalemia like this, absence of P waves, what is this called as? Why their P waves are absent? So the elevated potassium it suppresses the thymus node activity. What is? So the uh, hyper kalemia it suppresses the SNO activity. It suppresses the SNO activity. On the contrary, it will be the other way around. What hyper kalemia causes is the paralyzes the internodal tracts. So actually, the conduction uh, it, it paralyzes the atrium. So the no, uh, conduction occurs from through the internodal tracts so the atrium remains quiescent atrium is quiescent so you don't see p wave but the conduction does reach the av node so you don't see a white qrs complex this is called as a sinoventricular conduction if you are to ask these patients to take in a deep breath in and out you will find that the rr intervals actually will change in in response to the the respiratory movements indicating that the sinus arrhythmia is there so this is called as a sinoventricular conduction where you don't see p waves at set of p waves t waves which are taller next slide the patient was given the treatment potassium which was 8.6 came down to 6.2 and you can see here the p waves are come back T waves are still taller, but now their height has come down, and the R waves have become quite prominent. Next slide. Who is this? Can you recognize uh, this picture? Harvey. Harvey. <clears throat> Who described angina? <laughs> why is there so little response from the participants? I'm not sure why. Why are they not responding? I mean, there's so many of them logged on. Vincent, who described angina? <laughs> What is stable angina also called as? Vincent angina. Vincent angina. Yeah, thank you. Have you heard about William Heberden? Heberden sign, sir. Heberden. Uh -huh. Heberden sign. That feeling of constricting uh, in the. Is it called also, also is called as a Heberden angina? Yes, sir. Okay. Next slide. Who is this guy? You must know the history. Routine <laughs> check. <laughs> Just put a wild guess. I know him. Donald oh, Trump. Trump. Is it Cornyn? Huh? Is it Cornyn? Do you do coronary angio? Have you done coronary angiography in your lab? Sir, is it Cornyn? No. Stones. No, no. Have you I done? Stones. Have you done? Have you done coronary angiography in your lab? Yes, sir. Mason Stones. Huh? So Mason Stones. He is the one who has provided food for all of us. Okay, next slide. And then this, of course, you can't mistake. <laughs> Andrew Prince. Andrew Grusin. Grusin. Next one. Okay, now these are some of the angio spots. 
I have taken out. And uh, can you describe this angio spot? Of course, these are just taken the still frames. Waterfall signs. <clears throat> Give me a spot diagnosis looking at this. Left ventricular hypertrophy, left axis deviation. Where is the injection? Where is the catheter? Do you see the catheter? The IV. From the IVC, oh. it's from the femoral vein, IVC, IVC to RA. RA. Yeah. We are getting an injection. The dye is passing from the RA to the LA to the LV. To the LV. It's a, it's so, a case of uh, trigosid uh, atracia, sir. You can actually see a bud here. Do you yes, see sir. the bud here? Yes, sir. That is the atritic tracuspid valve. The very classical picture of the tricuspid atresia we inject into the right atrium. You see the waterfall is uh, opacified. Contrast gets into the left atrium. This whole bay remains vacant, except this small atretic tricuspid valve bud. Okay, next slide. Have you seen a picture like this? This is a spot picture from. A child who was born cyanosed. Uh, like this is the uh, case of pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum, which is showing the RVCCs, the coronary like communications with the RV. So these are actually the uh, coronary sinusoids, which are getting into the getting into the pulmonary arteries. Here you can see here, uh, you can see here uh, getting into the pulmonary. You're right. It's a track. It's a pulmonary atresia. With what intact septum? Yes, sir. Okay, next one. But what is this? Simple spot picture from a child who is born cyanotic. Single ventricle. Other course from the femoral vein, uh, IVC to RA. Let's try L. And TGS, sir. Uh, what is this ventricle? Is this left ventricle or right ventricle? Right ventricle. Uh, this right is ventricle. morphologically like left, left, left ventricle, but placed anteriorly. It's a little fabriculated ventricle. You can see it is fabriculated. Uh, it is the RV. The RV. Yes, what okay. is it giving rise to? Aorta, sir. It is TGA. Yeah, it is TGA. Next slide. And that's what you see in the same patient. The catheter has gone from the IVC to RA to? To the LV, sir. LV. And it is giving rise to pulmonary it artery. Giving rise to? PA, sir. Pulmonary PA. artery. Pulmonary artery. Right. Okay. Now, what, do you, what else do you see in this, uh, in this particular angio? I mean, it is very straightforward. You can see a fish tail shaped ventricle, which you call is a left ventricle. And where's the mitral valve? Do you see the mitral valve? Here's a mitral valve. So what is significant about this mitral valve in relation to this pulmonary valve? Is there a conus in between? There is usually a conus. Yes, sir. That is absent, sir. Absence of corner. So you can see there's no tissue between this mitral valve and the pulmonary valve. So this is very classical of the TGA. Next slide. Okay, what about this? Sir, uh, the course is from the uh, aorta to the from the femoral artery to the aorta. Yeah. Into the ventricle, it is showing a DORV, uh, double outlet right ventricle. Perfectly, very good. You, because you can see here, the catheter is getting into the anterior ventricle. You see, there is a large ventricular septal defect here. The left ventricle is seen, and what you see is the origin of both the great vessels uh, coming from the the yeah, right ventricle call is double outlet. This picture actually shows you the classical features of a double outlet right ventricle. Here's the mitral valve. The
the mitral aortic continuity is lost the mitral um, mitral pulmonary continuity is lost mitral aortic continuity is lost the bilateral coni this is very classical of a double outlet right ventricle when there are two coni miss double outlet right ventricle next slide what is this very simple balloon atrial septostomy pardon balloon atrial septostomy who described balloon atrial septostomy rashkin 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 okay yeah. correct rashkin described balloon atrial septostomy in which you put in a balloon into the left atrium inflate it and rupture the intraatrial septum okay next slide now this procedure is performed in the following condition tga tricuspid atresia pulmonary atresia intact septum all of the above or only in a tell me all of the above all of the above all of the above because you see many times the ultimately the outlet for the right side in blood to the systemic circulation is through the <coughs> septum so in tricuspid atresia pulmonary atresia intact septum If the opening is enough, there is no mixing of the blood, so you might have to take a recourse to perform and see balloon septostomy to at least do a mixing till the surgeon takes over. Next slide. What is this? Very straightforward. These are all map cards from the IOD. <coughs> You see the catheter somewhere? Here, there is a catheter. You see the catheter? Sir, so it's a the peak tail, sir, is in the ascending aorta. Yeah. So the aortic injection showing the map. Yeah, it's not map. This is aortic injection. And uh, what what type of dissection is this? So this is a type A with a severe uh, AR sir. The like contrast is filling the LV. Actually, you don't see the entry point here very clearly. So until unless you see the entry point point clearly here, maybe you will may call it is beyond the subclavian. So maybe you can call this type C also. Okay sir. and the catheter maybe i can't see the pictorial catheter is here so you may be right i think maybe the left ventricle scene i don't remember this case but there's definitely a dissection here and if you saw the flap coming all the way here and there is a involvement of the aortic valve then you can see a aortic regurgitation then of course it will become a type a will become an emergency situation for a surgery next slide this is an injection done in the left ventricle uh, can you tell me what is this typical feature of takotsubo sir huh? uh, it is like takotsubo takotsubo the lv the apex is... no no in that the apex balloons out here the apex is not ballooning out so what do you see here gaps here aneurysm sir Ventric, uh, apical Apical, yes. Apical, Ane what? Uh, aneurysm, sir. Oh, this is left ventricular injection. What do you see here? Apical uh, aneurysm. No, no, there is no aneurysm here. No aneurysm. Looks like a spade. Sir, uh, uh, apical uh, HCM, sir. Have you seen the pictures of uh, apical variant of HCM? Have you seen EMF? This is not this is not apoptotic cardiomyopathy. EMF, you seen the, all these filling defects here? Yes, sir. Endocardial myo endomyocardial fibrosis. You can see a filling. When you see this, something like a, you always take your shirt, put your hand and crumple it. So you see everything. Some areas are crumpled like this. That is a very typical pattern of endomyocardial fibrosis. This is a very mild form. Actually, you see many times such kind of a uh, puckering of the ventricular chamber. and you see those said they appear like filling defects next slide 
uh, what is this? Sir, it is a simultaneous like tracing of the uh, aortic and the LV like pressures, and uh, it is showing that post uh, the uh, induction of a like VPC, the aortic like. Uh, the aortic pressure is wow, coming down. What is happening to the left ventricular post ectopic? Sir, uh, post the ectopic beat, right? Yes, sir. All right. So, what happens to the post ectopic? The gradient happens to what? So, the, so the uh, LV pressure gradient? increases. Yeah, there is hardly any gradient, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And here gradient appears and get unmasked. What yes, is sir. this sign called as? Broken borrow, borrow broken sir. Right. Okay. Next slide. I think this X-ray similar one was shown by Satyaman, but I am showing you a little bit. He was asking you what are the confluence of the arteries you can see here the confluence of all the arteries this is a snowman appearance uh, is a very x-ray can be kept as a spot diagnosis what do you think this is what is this x-ray of here this is a snowman supracardiac say again supracardiac tbvc yeah so you can see here actually people call it a figure of eight or you can see a snowman appearance and this is what he was asking, you can label here. You can see the confluence occurs here. And uh, if it event, it was to come from here, uh, below the diaphragm, uh, what is that sign called as? Have you heard the word shimita? Yes, sir. Okay. See in, in PAPVC. Next one. Can you describe this? This is an angio picture. Describe a little bit. I know the diagnosis is very straightforward. Let me know from you. This is what? This is the... Cutter right. course from sir, IVC to the RA to the RV. Uh, IVC to... And what's happening to the pulmonary artery? Outflow tract? Sir, the RVOT is like was, you know, sir, it is pulmonary atresia. And anything else you see accompanying it? There is right ventricular hypertrophy. Anything else this can be other? even a tetralogy of fallow. Anything else you see accompanying it? Pulmonary atresia, VSD, what do you see? What else do you see? What is the aortic arch like? Right arch. Right arch. Sir. Right aortic arch. So, what are the conditions which are associated with right aortic arch in the congenital oh, arch? Tetralogy of fallow. Oh, and Pankasar what about this? The pulmonary atresia. Do you see pulmonary atresia in the right aortic arch? Do you see? Which is a condition in which the right aortic, synotic condition in which right aortic arch is very rare. You see a synotic tile and you see right aortic arch and you rule out that condition. More or less. Easy. Have you read in TGA, aortic, aortic, right aortic arch of course? No, Very sir. uncommon. Okay, next one. Next one. Okay, can somebody... Now this is a continuous reading of a patient who had a QRS <coughs> complex tachycardia. Next slide. It is a continuous strip. Now can you tell me the diagnosis? What diagnosis? So it is looking like epicardial VT, sir. It's a regular white complex tachycardia yeah. 
with a uh, like a notched QRS. With a notched notch in the R. Yeah. So why do you say it is ventricular tachycardia? Why not supraventricular tachycardia with apparent conduction? Apparent capture beat. Correct. You see capture beat. You see sinus captures, and you see fusion beats here. Once you see fusion beats like this between the sinus beats and the vent, white cord is complex. It can't be anything else except ventricular tachycardia. Next slide. Who's this? I'm showing you pictures of the people because of whom we are today making our livelihood. At least you should remember them. Who described acute myocardial infarction in the pathology lab and prophesized that the opening the artery will be the only way a patient could be salvaged? These are his words. Who described myocardial infarction in the pathology lab? Have you heard one name, James Herrick? He's James Herrick, the Chicago physician who, whose patient died of anterior wall infarction. He went to the pathology department. They opened up the, all the arteries. He saw a red clot in the left anterior descending artery and he prophesied at that time. At that time, nothing was known. Nothing was heard about the thrombolysis angioplasty, nothing. And he says, the only hope for this man lies in opening up this artery by some way. That's why he prophesies. Next one. Okay, now, can see, this is, these are the two tracings of the chambers in the tetralogy of fallow and pulmonic stenosis. What do you see the difference between the two? The ventricular tracings. In uh, the one with, with, with like PS, it is a narrow with a very like narrow peak, and the one with fallow, it's a, uh, like a like triangle shape. Yes, sir. Like a triangle shape. Triangle shape. It's got a flat head top, like correct. Yes, sir. So if you were to see a patient with tetralogy of fallow, you record simultaneous pressures in the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Next slide. They'll exactly appear like this because the now right ventricle pressure tracings also will have similar, more or less, a flat top like that of a left ventricle. Next slide. Okay. Now, I want you to find out, let me know when in the tent or in the balloon era we are talking about restenosis because that's the biggest challenge. And we keep on talking about binary restenosis. So have you known what do we mean by binary restenosis? Restenosis of 50%. Restenosis at six months, at one year, 50%. Restenosis of 50% or restenosis of 50%. Restenosis of 50%. 50%. Sir. 50%. Correct. So if at all, because we divide them into two groups. Binary means dividing them into two groups. There are two groups in 50% or more less than 50%. If more than 50%, then you find out how many people had more than 50% restenosis at the six months time. And then we define the restenosis, binary restenosis. Next slide, please. And I think that's probably the last slide. Now we all inflate balloon. Okay, then we tell our technician, come on, Increase it to one atmosphere or one bar, two bar, three bar, 10 bars, 20 bars. Now, have you, this bar word we have heard now, but we have known about PSI, pounds per square inch. Now, one bar equals to how much? 20 PSI, 14.5, 14.5, 1.5 PSI. What 
How much does it? Fourteen point five, sir. Fourteen point five. Correct. You are good in physics. So it is fourteen point five psi. And when you go to your your gas station, you fill up the air in your tire. The pressure that you tell him to put in. Twenty two, twenty five, twenty eight, thirty eight, thirty two. Thirty, sir. Thirty, thirty. Thirty. So that is yes, sir. Right. So you can imagine how much pressure what balloon can take for 14.5 psi small tiny balloon can take up 4.5 psi and the earlier balloons used to rupture because they could not withstand that kind of a pressure even at the lower pressure they used to rupture because the one bar is equal to 14.5 by pounds per square inch i think that's it uh, uh, shiv Yes, sir. Uh, we can end here. Yes, sir. Uh, I think with that we come to the end of this session, and as well as this uh, season of uh, face the examiner. And um, I would request Dr. Palajani sir to give his concluding remarks, followed by Dr. Satyavan Sharma sir, and of course Dr. Narayan. Yes. Uh, Sir, I I feel that. Uh, this program despite all the glitches and uh, being virtual on the virtual platforms and which we are not used to and but young people are but we usually are sort of face to face when we talk we see moving people talking people and uh, we feel energized also they also feel energized and uh, then i think that gives a different feeling absolutely it's not as good as being close But and uh, you know there is a ghazal by talat mahmud i i'm sure all of you must have heard tasveer teri dil mera behla na sakegi so this actually exactly is like that our tasveer and is not going to sort of make them feel happy but even then when we are not there at least the photograph or the picture gives some solace and uh, we try to sort of come up to some expectations may not be the full expectations and uh, i do hope that uh, next time when we meet we will certainly be sort of live and uh, giving them the program uh, in one of the cities either mumbai or hyderabad and our faculty is always there with us you you have got a charm to attract most of the people uh, friends from lucknow from delhi and uh, i am i'm thankful to all of them and especially to narayan to sandeep to rama and uh, i think they they have been a real backbone of this our ongoing programs they have always been with us and satyavan to of course and you are always there and i'm i can always say that i'm always there and uh, next time maybe i think we'll be in a better shape as a, but i only say this way that uh, exam that is being conducted and uh, we get stuck up on apex b we get up at apex b on is it left ventricular right ventricular is it uh, uh, is it heaving is it uh, diffuse some of the other, i think in today's time when we have access to so many sort of a technologies available i think that kind of a time should not be wasted on such such things but of course i am no more a teacher i have passed my age but believe you me even when i was a teacher some 20 years back i used to insist on my co teachers please don't waste time on that i used to bring an ecg and x ray with the examination was in my center sign hospital i'll insist on showing them ecg x ray because examination was at that time because that time still the echo was still in the earlier stages i believe that whatever technology is available one should have an access to make a final diagnosis because when you sit in a clinic and you see a patient when you are in doubt you always look at the x ray look at the ecg look at the echo So, but one thing is that history gives you a path 
how to proceed, what investigation to ask for. ECG widens your spectrum. Echo, you see it further widens your spectrum. It is a beginning or is a stepping stone, but it is not the only stone because there are miles to go ahead to make a diagnosis. And even after all that, we cannot come to a diagnosis. So I think uh, exam patterns should change. All these young boys, uh, young friends, young colleagues who are there as examiners, request to them, please change the exam pattern and uh, sort of test them more on the echo, test, test them more on the types of <coughs> catheters. I think it should change. The time has changed. And uh, I'm sure they will change. And uh, But as I said, one has to go on the way it has to go. One has to go on a stepping stone with the history, physical examination, but not to lose much of time on that. But ultimately, they are the examiners. Our our famous examiner is here, Dr. Pratap, Pratap Bhai is here. And uh, he, he, he is the most favored examination examiner because he passes everybody. Kya <laughs> Pratap, you are mute. Pratap. You are mute. Pratap is a very, very lenient examiner. वो मेरे को बोलता है कि सर तकलीफ होता है स्टूडेंट को फेल करने के लिए बहुत तकलीफ करना पड़ता है और छह महीने पास ही होता है उसको दुखी करके क्या मतलब है अरे मैंने तो यूनिवर्सिटी को लिखा है एग्जाम बंद कर दो पीपल टेक अ कॉल हु इज अ गुड कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट एंड हु इज अ बैड कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट सो एनीवे Pratap, thank you very much and uh, providing with good case. Yeah. And, uh, I think Milan also yeah. uh, did a good backup. Hethan did a very good job on the echocardiography today. And uh, we, uh, I also learned a lot and I had forgotten a lot of cardiology. Yeah. But yeah. I think also a lot of yeah. is an inspiration. So, at this end, you have taken this effort that is very... Means admirable. <laughs> we don't know whether he will. It's Shiv who's pushing me. I don't want to be in this line now anymore. <laughs> but anyway, I'm thankful to all of you and uh, thankful to all the students. I hope they got their, their uh, time's worth. Their time's worth. And thank to the Intas who have put in a tremendous effort and uh, done a marvelous job on this. Uh, virtual platforms and uh, spread the message of teaching of cardiology, especially to Vara, to Chandrasekhar and his whole team. And um, uh, I think we'll probably meet hopefully next week in person. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, Dr. Satyavan Sharma, sir. Uh, actually, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Actually, Sarah told everything, so I have very little to add. But I, I think, you know, what uh, our exams have already started changing. Of course, uh, I had very long innings as an examiner, fortunately. Not long, longest, longest ever in the history of cardiology in India. <laughs> Almost of two decades. So, you know, I've seen a lot of changes happening from, you know, mid 80s to now. I think what we really need to, our boys are extremely intelligent you know they have got much more facilities than what we had at our time i think what we need to do is to have more and more integrated approach and how we are training them needs to be improved and i think there pratap has a point you know that why have examination if you are training for three years very very nicely so i think we will require a lot of reorientation which i think the thinking is already developing in various institutions that you know how you train them and if somebody has got trained very well during these 3 years beginning from clinical to angiography to echocardiography to mri then um, i think this type of examination system exam system will change it's already started changing and i think whatever we have been doing i think from, <laughs> From face the examiners, possibly maybe we will modify our title also, how to train the cardiologists for future and early career years. So maybe it was a real uh, pleasant experience uh, during the last two days. I will just end by telling if there is any student who is still logged in and if he wants to tell us something, 
I think that will be a good takeaway for us. Actually, I asked Linson that if any, at least two, three students, if we can, they can express what exactly they felt in the last two days. So Linson, do you have anybody with you? Uh, sir, uh, I thought I'll ask. Uh, I did not prepare for that, sir. I'll ask at the end, sir. So since sir has asked, uh, if anyone is ready, can uh, contribute, please. We have, sir. We have a few students, sir. Okay, please ask them to put up their views. Dr. Nirmal, are you there? I think we can end the program and uh, maybe it's a lunch time for everyone. Yes, I think we will move on. Yeah. And Dr. Narayan sir, you, you, were plan you were saying something. No, no, I just wanted to thank everybody. Okay. It was a wonderful experience and uh, I missed out on some of the lectures and some of the cases because of, you know, some other commitments which I had prior uh, sort of planned. Okay. But uh, every time it is a great learning experience from hearing from all the senior people and it's a great revision also. Okay. The only thing is that, um, you know, it's, as, as Dr. Bailajani said, ki tasveer se man nahi bharta hai. It is always, you know, good to see people moving around and, you know, interacting person to person. So maybe next year or in the next uh, coming uh, plan, which we have the same year, 2021. 20, yeah. So thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, entire people for this platform. And uh, hope to see you soon, everybody. Thank you. Narayan. Sir, sir. In, in Lucknowi language, I will tell you next year when we meet. आपको देख के करार आया बिल्कुल ठीक है लखनवी लैंग्वेज में थोड़ा बोलेंगे बिल्कुल 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 सर बिल्कुल ये तो है कि जो बात है मैं एक दूसरे को देखने में वो जो है वीडियो पे वर्चुअल पे उतना मजा नहीं है सर बट अब हालात ऐसे हैं क्या किया जाए but sir, after you are with family, you can do your job also. You can do so many things. Are you traveling? I'm not sure. 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 i but uh, us mein bhi apna maza tha ek nahi sir har cheez limit mein maze mein rehti over to toxicity or poison acha hoga thank you sir for doing a wonderful job thank you sir thank you very much our program in proper place finding out the right people to give right lectures and uh, this shows your popularity that this time despite the program being not live, but still you had 450 or 480 uh, students listening to all of us. And uh, otherwise in the house, nobody listens to us. So, <laughs> so it is good. At least we have some people to listen to us. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And all that, uh, Satyavan, Narayan, and Pratap. The entire faculty, please convey our best wishes to them and thanks, Intas. Th thank you, everyone, and thanks, sir. It was your motivation, and basically, we I really get admired after seeing you, Satyavan Sharma, sir. That I know even now you have so much of enthusiasm to participate and to do this. That is the biggest motivation for us, and I really thank each and every for uh, you know, Dr. Narayan, sir, Dr. Nathani, Melin, Rama, Sandeep, Rishi. Uh, Dr. B.C. Srinivas and our observers. It was a wonderful meeting for the last two days. Despite being a virtual platform, we could somehow organize and then we could get so many uh, candidates for us. So with that, I would like to end. And uh, Linson, you want to give the final comments, please? Yes, sir. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Vijibal, so, audible, both. 
Good afternoon, everyone. It's indeed a privilege for me to be sharing the vote of thanks. I would like to thank Academy of Cardiology for organizing the event this year, as well as for the last six years. I take the opportunity to thank the course directors, Dr. Dev Pahlajani, Dr. Satyawan Sharma, and Dr. Shiv Kumar for designing the course and providing the finest platform for cardiology students in India to learn and prepare for exam and the career ahead. I would like, like to thank all the distinguished faculty members who are the best in country in taking time out and being with us these two days. I thank all the participants who have participated actively and made this event a great success. The highest number of participants we had this year on both the days. Special appreciation to all trainees who participated in the clinical case, x-rays and spotters, trainees from Ames, Jaydeva, Batra, Sri Chitra, Neil Ritan Sarkar, SSKM. That needs a lot of courage and you have exhibited it well. I would also like to extend our gratitude to the organizing committee and every member of the team who have worked tirelessly for the last three months and ensured this event is a grand success. Lastly, I thank our digital partners, Studio One, the support staff for giving us the much needed support in conducting the event during these COVID times. In case I have missed any, kindly forgive. Once again, thank you so much. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Jai Hind, Jai Hind.